If you ever feel like it's all so jover, just come over, hop into the stream at twitch.tv slash hasanabi live almost every day from sunny west l.a i'll cover daily news so tune in now see what i have to say blast off blast off if you're unhinged prepare to take a week of hasan hasan i swear to god allah please end this long pause the stream when I'm on company time boss makes a dollar and I only make a dime that's why I watch the stream when I'm on company time like now I'm probably in the chat right now What's going on, everybody? I hope everyone's having a fantastic evening, a fantastic afternoon, a fantastic greener, no matter where you are in the world. You're just a debate perv, of you course Piker. you hate yourself. It's awesome broadcast, Every baby. Thought to justify your own self-worth to someone else. And we're live and alive, and I hope all the boys, girls, and MBs are having a fantastic one, because today's a beautiful day, today's a wonderful day. Today is uh, Janksgiving. That's right. Escape. How unhinged can one chatter get? Don't ban him, mod. There are new pets. Show me the light and set me free from this black pill reality. Can I find hope? Can I debate for this top of the hour break? Boss makes a dollar and I only make a dime. That's why I watch the stream. When I'm on company time, boss makes a dollar and I only make a dime. That's why I watch the stream when I'm on company time like now. What's going on, folks? I hope all the boys, girls, and enemies are having a fantastic one. That is Cam Carduzion, Hospil. The beanie is so micro, it's looking like a no-brim hot. That is what it is. It is a no-brim. It's the Yankee. It's a designated Yankee with the with no-brim. Anyway, folks, I'm live and alive on this beautiful day. It is another sunny day here in California, Los Angeles. 78 degrees and sunny here. And it is Thursday, November 23rd, 2023. Um, 11.52 a.m. and I'm a little late and I apologize and I'll tell you exactly why because this is part of the broadcast where I tell you all about my personal news in between the time period where I press the stop streaming button and press the start streaming button. That's right. Um, This is that moment. This is that moment, that time again. For all the parasocialists out there, how's your beard already back? I mean, I did shave it on... I did shave it 23 days ago, so it is normal for it to grow this hard. Thankful for you. I'm thankful for you guys. All right, folks. This is parasocialist update time. All right. It's already been 23 days since I shaved my beard. Um, do you use your Apple Watch for fitness? Yes, I do. Anyway, last night I ended the broadcast and I went to dinner with my lovely family. We went on a decadent dining experience once again. And uh, I definitely did not eat well. And I definitely am not eating well today either. So, But it's Thanksgiving, so it don't matter. Happy Thoughtsgiving to everybody. Turkey isn't the only thing getting stuffed. Ooh, you're one of my favorite. I'm so thankful to have you in my life. Send this to 10 of the nastiest pilgrims you know. If you get three back, then you are a real one. Happy Thoughtsgiving. 
Massive racist riot happening in Dublin right now. The fuck are they riding for? There was a Luffy parade float. Yeah, we're going to be talking about all of that. Anyway, I had a decadent, uh, decadent dining, decadent meal, a decadent dining experience. Um, I'll take a look at what's going on in Dublin in a moment. In a moment. What the fuck is going on in Dublin? Uh, violent protests break out in Dublin after five people, including children injured in a knife attack. Crowd chanting anti-immigrant slogans, clashes with police officers, hours after a man stabbed a woman, and three young children outside of school. Okay, that's crazy. Anyway, um, all the girls are leaving the, to get themselves big boys. Yeah. Is there a link to the banger intro song? Yeah, just look up Hospilled from Cam Carduzian. Let me see if I can just get only the song. Yeah, here. Here it is. Show some love for the song. Anyway, um, but yeah, decadent meal last night. Uh, and then afterwards, came back home. Kaya had escaped. Kaya had uh, breached containment. She always does. Like, I leave her in my room, and she just opens the door now. There is no containing her. But it's okay. She doesn't do anything bad. She just kind of chills in the house. So, not the end of the world, you know? Anyway, um... But yeah, went to sleep, woke up this morning, had a big ass walk, and got a long ass structured walk this morning as I was um, gathering my thoughts for the day. Uh, as far as things to watch, I'm all over Pluto, and that shit's pretty good. I mean, Pluto is a is a great anime. Maybe it lays it on a little bit too thick. Maybe it's a little too aggressively uh, paralleled with what is going on uh, with American. Uh, with American foreign policy, but it's really fucking good overall. Love it. Um, obviously, like, one of the major things that I cannot comprehend is, like, why they simply cannot recover robots, since they're robots, after all, but that's fine. Have you watched this week's Jujutsu Kaisen? It's an old manga. Oh, uh, Pluto is the anime that I've been watching. It, it is literally about the Iraq War. You can... T I mean, yes. The, the major... Like, the... The United States of Thracia fighting against the, what is it? The Central Persian Empire. But it's like, it's, it's literally Saddam. They're fighting against Saddam. The guy looks like Saddam. They basically have WMDs in it and they're fake. There's no real WMDs found. Then there's also like a lot of theory of evolution. I mean, or, or, you know, some eugenic stuff too. Uh, what it means to be human, uh, what it means to be human, you know, all this good stuff, all this fun stuff. Anyway. It's on Netflix for those of you who don't know. What it means to be human. Yes. Human. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Um, but yeah, beyond that, uh, you know, my family is going to slowly trickle into the house today. And of course, one of those people is going to be Jank. Murata is already hiding in here in the room because he thinks that he can hide from my mom if he stays in here and he doesn't make like too much noise or movement. He believes that my mom like alien versus predator will not be able to will not be able to catch him in the act and will not be able to demand things from him like last year that's what they're saying Maradis rise up in the chat anyway bro typical youngest sibling i swear also just watched a clip of you doing this to Murat like five minutes ago lamau yeah i do this to Murat all the time but it's just like out you as hiding in here taking shelter from my mom anyway uncle nephew Face off later or ceasefire being delayed. Actors losing their jobs over Palestine and more. Get in now. By the way, I will say this. I will say this. Last night I played, uh, as you guys know, last night I, I played uh, Alan Wake for some of you who know, who are watching, and some of you who do not know. Does anyone have the meme of Jank looking like... Uh, Kevin, whatever the fuck. Yeah, I need that meme. I want to put it. I want to use that as my blast off image today. <laughs> no, not the titty one. Jesus Christ. Fuck. Okay. Someone probably photoshopped it, Murat. Murat is asking if that's AI. Um, who's Jenks running mate? Hank Pecorino. Uh, Italian. An Italian will never be vice president in this country. Show Jank that he is now the favorite huh? candidate of TikTok. Yeah, don't worry. We're gonna we're gonna fucking show Jank all the presidential memes and stuff, all of the memes that you've been making. We will show him all of that. But anyway, let's blast off. Um, wait, actually, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna save this Help. in a different playlist right now. But yeah, 
Let's blast off. We're live and alive. We're live and alive. We're live and alive. We're live and alive. Get in. Get in. Show him the titty one. Shut the fuck up, young PZ. I'm going to ban you. Maybe. Um, but anyway, Alan Wake Gaming was yesterday. It was great. You better finish it. No, I, I, I've been thinking about Alan Wake a lot. It's, uh, it's very narratively focused. It's a little bit all over the place for the time being. I don't fully understand the concept of Alan Wake because I haven't, you know, played the first game, I guess. But I will tell you that it is stuck in my mind. Um, I also started, I also started reading, um, I know, during my poop sessions, uh, reading Rashid Khalid's, uh, uh, 100 Years, Rashid Khalidi's, uh, 100 Years of, uh, 100 Years War about Palestine. This is the book that, this is the book that, uh, that uh, friend of the show Lolo was watching, or, I mean, reading. Qatar announces when Israel Hamas truce will begin. We'll talk about that. Yeah. I prefer to watch books. Reading while pooping is a classic. Yeah, it's pretty good. But yeah, 100 Years War on Palestine by Rashid Khalidi is what I'm reading at the moment. His family, and I did not know this, was uh, on the pro-Ottoman side, it seems, of the uh, Palestinians. Some of which who, who literally died fighting against uh, the British. Most Arabs are, believe me. And that's not how history showed itself. You know, I'm going to tell you how she goes to um, a base coworker ordered that book for the store I work at, despite the amount of Zionists we work with. Nice. I mean, that's crazy to be fucking mad at that, by the way. That's just like a, a book, a historical book. Murat says the only historical books he reads are from Rush Limbaugh or, or Bill O'Reilly, he says. Sorry. Um, but yeah, imagine looking at like a book that was written by a historian and being like, I actually don't like that. I actually, I actually think that it's not allowed. Bill O'Reilly's new book, Killing Palestine. Yeah, Bill O'Reilly's killed every fucking historical figure. Bill O'Reilly's book. <laughs> Why calming music? I want to hear pain and misery. There is no pain and misery. It's Thanksgiving. It's a day of celebration. It's a day of joy. Okay. There will be also some uh, spirited debate in the marketplace of ideas, of course. But what are you most excited for, Dindin? Um, we went and we just like kind of ordered all the sides this time around. And other than that, we have uh, turkey that we're that grandma's making and we should probably make a lot more than just the turkey i assume because she can't stop herself she can't help herself she has to but yeah i uh i love this uh we'll get started on this fun news day with this one fun news obviously there's not a lot of fun news beyond that but uh this is fun elon is refusing to make a deal with swedish unions and is now learning about sympathy strikes in the nordic labor model um this is insanity squared tesla strike killing both blow for tesla the cars do not get new license plates if metal strike will stop new Tesla cars from being put into service, the reason is the sympathy measure that blocks post Nord's handling of mail to Tesla. He goes, this is insane. Yeah. My man is completely unfamiliar with the fact that there can be uh, strikes on, a, on one industry or one company across uh, multiple different vectors. That's, it's very normal. That's how unions are supposed to work. But of course... If you're some fucking apartheid, yeah. If metal is the name of the union, I know. Don't aren't they also the guys who unionized? If metal is, I think like, isn't I F metal the the uh, the German union as well, or am I crazy? Or I guess it's a metal trade union in Sweden. They the German one has a similar name too. No, that's I G metal. Okay, my bad. Uh, if metal stasida is a trade union in Sweden, and the German one is um, I G metal. And I remember because they are the uh, dominant metal workers union and they wanted to, they wanted to actually do, 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 unionize YouTubers, if I remember correctly. Industrial union metal is transliteration. Swedish IF metal union says they have funds to strike for 500 years. 500 years. Yeah. I don't know exactly. Oh, dude. I don't know the, the, is the Swedish model the one that also uh, directly contributes to like, Actually, I'm not going to speak on it. I don't know. I, I, I think like they have, um, yeah, they have insane, they have uh, insane pull. Porsche is unionized under IG Metal. Yeah. Membership density of 80% on formation. It had 337,000 members, but it fell steadily to 241,000. IF Metals represents around, in, around 11,500 workplaces. 21% are women. 15% are under 30 years of age in a variety of sectors, including... Mechanical engineering in the plastics industry, the building material industry, the mining sector, the ironwork sector, the textile industry, including clothing, automobile repair shops, disabled workers doing similar types of government-sponsored projects, including Sam Hall. 
They're the second largest affiliate of the Swedish Trade Union Confederation. Yeah. Good stuff. More power to them. <laughs> Boss sells seething over worker chads. That's, <laughs> that's funny. Illegal in most other countries. Uh, uh, this is a, a sympathy strike. I love that. I, it makes me happy. This doubly makes me happy because, one, it's solidarity in action. Two, it shows the effectiveness of unions in making demands. And last but not least, perhaps one of the more important reasons also is that it pisses off Elon Musk, and I fucking love that personally. Sweden is a very interesting country that still absolutely rests on the laurels of, like, the democratic socialist uh, era that they had, like, straight up. You know how we always talk about the New Deal and FDR's America and, and how all of the gains made during that era are basically why America has, like, some semblance of even development, which it doesn't anymore, but, like, did for years and years. Yes, RIP all of Palme, but, like, the, the Swedish democratic socialism era was so incredibly powerful. Obviously, it also spells trouble for social democracies in general because you look at Sweden now, but why don't you like Elon? He's brought good to this world. Yeah, dude, uh, totally. Shut up, Marat. Shut up, bitch. You're not allowed to speak. Ah, the Hamnar Beta Re Verbunted. The Dock Workers Union won't unload Teslas. Painters Union won't do the paint jobs. There's a lot of different sectors in it. The socialists were right. Social democracy is always doomed to slide backwards to fascism. Yes, of course. I mean, it. you know. Mysterious cosmic ray observed in Utah. Explain that, Marat. You can't. He can't. He won't, actually. It's classified. Saw this doing the rounds and thought of your stream stories. What is this? When I was 15 years old, I started my first fucking job. Like many of you motherfuckers probably did too. Except mine was a little more fucked up. I worked in something called a horse insemination plant. Oh, dude. Yeah, I, yeah I've done this. I mean, not me personally, but I've, I've seen it happen. Every goddamn day, I would get up in the morning and I'd go to this fucking barn. And I'd have to walk down a line. The horse on either goddamn... Okay, I don't want to watch the rest of this, but yeah, you get the idea. He just jerks off horses for a living. See what's going on with Josh Giddy on OKC? Yes, I have. Um, Josh Giddy, Australian uh, uh, alleged pedophile point guard. Uh, I did. I did see it. It was all over my timeline this morning. Um, I don't know how old the girl is. I don't know how old the girl is, but... Uh, it seems like she's very young. They call him Josh Kitty on Twitter. Yeah. The worst dudes discussed the Israel-Palestine conflict. Bro, I don't know if I want to watch this, man. I don't know if I want to watch this. Especially when Norm Finkelstein is about to fucking grace the timeline today with a Piers Morgan uncensored interview. You know what I mean? That's my Super Bowl. That's my Thanksgiving turkey bowl. You know what I mean? She's above 16 and the age of consent is 16 in Oklahoma. God damn, brother. That is some crazy ass bullshit. It's also crazy because like literally half the timeline uh, immediately after it came out that she was like underage, half the fucking timeline started being like, damn, bro, he had he had good taste. And I was just like, dude, you're a pedophile. You're a pedophilic person. Until I found out half of those NBA accounts are literally like 16 themselves. <laughs> but still. Uh, never going to dodge the Willie Mac accusations. He's a shooting guard. My bad. Not point guard. Shooting guard. Can we stop mentioning this fucking loser? Jesus Christ. It's enough. Today's my birthday. Happy birthday. Anyway. um, Yeah. Tate just took the most left take that we would agree to compete. To be honest, but fuck him anyway. Yeah. That's part of the reason why I don't want to watch it. Because, like, he's going to say some... He's going to say some shit that I agree with. And then it's just going to frustrate me. You know what I mean? Are we going to have some fun today? Uh, Yeah. German Thanksgiving is a tradition. What is it? Real quick, just want to say happy Thanksgiving to you all. Hope you had a good one today. I thought I, thought I wasn't going to miss this. I thought I was going to get it out there too late. But I'm thankful for you. Let's just get it out there, right? That's why I made this video. I am thankful for you and I had a great turkey day. Hope you did too. Hope you ate plenty of turkey. Hope you had plenty of sausages, plenty of bacon, plenty of ham. All the things that we love to have during our Thanksgiving feasts. I had plenty of it today. I'm thankful for you. I'll see you soon. Hey, everybody, real quick. Yeah, just want to say happy yeah, Thanksgiving to you all. All that cake he had went right to his cake, if you know what I mean. Classic. 
This is why so many of you are Germaniacs. It's like clear to me. Gum gum tree got him. I know, dude. I know. What a sad state of affairs. Luffy's hat on the One Piece balloon got burst at the Thanksgiving parade. This makes me so sad, bro. This is my 9-11? Yeah. No! This is his first parade! No! Bucket hat Luffy go kind of hard, though. This is what I mean, dude. Zoomers have no, no respect. Oh, no, it's gonna... Oh! oh! Yeah. Bucket hat is Trafalgar Law. Well, I guess not, really. He has, like, a weird... He doesn't even have a bucket hat. He has a different kind of hat, but... There's riots in Dublin. I can hear explosions of helicopters and armed police are out. I heard. I heard uh, that there's, like, race riots or some shit happening. These fucking balloons are never a good idea. Yeah, I don't really care about the, the Thanksgiving parade at all. But a lot of funny memes have occurred as a consequence of that. For example, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people protesting... Talking about how uh, Thanksgiving is a celebration of genocide back then. And there's a genocide currently happening. Now, of course, it's a very serious thing to mention. However, when you put it in front of a Despicable Me banner, in front of uh, fucking Minions, for example, all of a sudden it just kind of seems like the Minions participated in the genocide, which is, of course, not even wrong. I mean, I guess they technically do because they're like evil, right? They work with like all of the evil. Bro doesn't know what's going on. Bro's just thinking banana. Who? <clears throat> yeah, we're going to talk about Melissa Barrera. Yeah. Minions definitely participated in the Nakba. I'm almost certain. Uh, never asked the Minions what they were doing. Uh, never asked the Minions what they were doing about, uh, between 1941 and 1945. But also, don't ask the Minions what they were doing during the Nakba. Um, I, well, I mean, I know they were sending illicit arms after the armistice. Uh, they were sending illegal arms from Czechoslovakia into Israel. That's right. That's what the fuck they were doing. I'll tell you what. That's a banger tweet. Actually, I'm going to fucking tweet this. I'm going to say that it was mid. Don't why was it? Is it mid? Actually, the means were stuck in the Arctic between 1920s and 1950. They said it in the first minions movie. Oh, yeah, nothing bad happened after 1950, so banger tweet it. I think I have a lot of anti-intellectuals in here, okay? I'm, I'm Palestinian, and I laughed. It's not mid. Where were the minions during the Tulsa massacre? Good question. You know what they were doing. They were the reason why uh, the, the racist, the white supremacist forces were able to utilize a plane for the first time ever when they were dropping munitions on top of civilian territory in the United States of America, as a matter of fact. By Arctic, they mean Southern Argentina. Where were they during the Confederacy? Uh, defending slavers. Duh. Yes. I mean, this is, this is canon. I've never seen a single fucking piece of Despicable Me franchise uh, at all. But I know. I know that the Minions 100% were, were doing all of those things. The Minions are supposed to be... What is this? What the fuck? Who did the minions serve from 1933 to 1945? Mr. Dave, why exactly do minions love bananas so much? <laughs> Wait, they love bananas? Oh, that also makes sense. Oh, fuck. All right, let's... All voices. And so I'm joined now by Professor Norman Finkelstein. Professor, thank you very much indeed. Uh, oh, I got to do this. I appreciate thank it. You. And like thank I said, a lot, of people me. Wanted, a lot of people thank wanted you. me to interview. You yourself uh -oh. tweeted that uh, we, we hadn't done it. So here we are. I'm glad about it. Um, I think you're an influential voice. And you've obviously been very uh, vocal uh -oh. about this since it all uh, kicked off. I want to take you back. It's a Thanksgiving uh, if, if miracle may, for to, me. To October the 7th. Because... To what happened uh oh, October immediately he's like, you don't condemn Hamas. Many people. Uh, you uh, posted on Substack uh, a piece about what had happened on the day. 
And it included this. For the past 20 years, the people of Gaza, half of whom are children, have been immured in a concentration camp. Today, they breach the camp's walls. If we honour John Brown's armed resistance to slavery, if we honour the Jews who revolted in the Warsaw Ghetto, the moral consistency commands that we honour the heroic resistance in Gaza. I, for one, will never begrudge. On the contrary, it warms every fibre of my soul. The scenes of Gaza smiling children as their arrogant Jewish supremacist. This is why I said Norm is a little bit humbled. too extra. And you ended by for saying me? the stars above in heaven are looking kindly down. Glory, glory, hallelujah. The souls of Gaza go marching on. Uh, with the benefit of, of uh, a few weeks now, do you regret the tone of that initial response to what happened? No. My initial Did response you? was to the initial news stories. You will recall, I'm sure, that initially what we were informed was that there was a break, uh, breakout from Gaza concentration camp that approximately 1,500 people had broken out and that about 50 it is too people, much. that was I the agree. initial number that was given, approximately 50 he talked about this in, uh He talked about this in the great detail. The gradually grew, went from 50, a couple of days later it went to 100, and I'm sure you'll remember the number didn't reach 1,400 until about 10 days later. Initially, it was reasonable, <clears throat> excuse me, it was reasonable to assume that people had been killed in a firefight, which was not the case, at least not fully the case. So my initial reaction was to the initial news stories. By the third or fourth day, I was clearly compelled to rethink my initial statements and try to make sense of what was clearly a moral quandary. And at that point, I want to I pause so bad. Revised my, not revised, but I uh, considered my judgment on the basis of the new information that was available. Okay. And my own sense. Yes, go I ahead. Just wanna, I, just wanna, I just want to look. I've done a timeline uh, for my own benefit uh, based on what happened that day. We know the attacks began at 6 30 in the morning. Uh, we know that at 11 18. AM, Israel confirmed, as you say, 40 dead, 700 injured. At 11.35, Benjamin Netanyahu said, we are at war. At 12.30 that day at lunchtime, I tweeted, horrifying and appalling scenes from Israel. This murderous, indiscriminate Hamas terror attack on Israeli people is shameful and indefensible. By 4.17... Israel said 100 were dead at least, 985 wounded. Civilian hostages have been taken. At 4 o'clock, uh, a little later than that, around the same time, footage is released of the attack reporting that 3,000 uh, bombs and firearms have been fired off by Hamas. Civilians have been killed. He has a really interesting so on. take on uh, this process that I don't fully agree with, but I do at, understand at nine, where he's coming uh, from. 16. And I don't think Piers will allow him to talk about it uh, from, like, substack. the perspective of Nat Turner uh, and, and W.B. Uh, Dubois and, uh, the, the, and the, others the who looked at uh, slave rebellions, so uh, Haitian issues, Revolution, uh, and how uh, violent it was, the retaliatory uh, actions, how barbaric and violent those actions were. Three days, anyone had a clue I, I'm speaking over Piers because he's just like, here. this is his opportunity to just, like, bully Norm over his initial writing. And I just um, don't understand why someone as scholarly as you, as expert in this region, in this conflict as you are, why your response would be that for several days, one of glorifying in the... Uh, in, in, what, in what you called heroic resistance. The boys. Whereas mine, and I've always tried to be fair-minded about the boys. this conflict and reported it for CNN and tried to be fair and accurate as and when I've seen it, uh, that I, at midday... I couldn't listen day, to the whole True Anon interview. It's way too fucking long, but I listened to parts of it. And horrifying and also, I've been scenes. trying to get Brace to help me I just don't, uh, connect I just don't with Norm for weeks now. I you weren't aware, with great respect, about the scale mm -hmm. of what was going on. Okay, Pierce, let me begin by saying I want to have a civil conversation and I'm going to do my darndest to remain faithful to the facts and faithful to truth. I'll do my darndest not to exaggerate. The first thing I have to say is I don't tweet. I've never been on Twitter. I have three young tech people who <laughs> I send statements to and then they make the decision where to place it on Substack, on Twitter, and so forth. Okay, I just want to clear that up. 
I made one statement on the first day on the basis of the information that was available to me. The information yeah, I was think Piers is so funny to be people like people had been killed. Elin, no, you also said it was clear from what's going on. I you don't understand. This man is a is fucking shallow. Omega Boomer. He only has a landline. He probably had no fucking clue what was going on. That's not true. As the numbers, okay. like it's just not true. you and I, we, we are saying? online all the time. So our assessment is like we have round the clock updates on what's going on. He fucking doesn't. He is a landline. You want me to believe you when you say you weren't aware? Of the scale but again, this part is like uh, silly, irrelevant bullshit. Come on, come on, move on, move on, move on. This is this is stupid. Move on. Piers, Piers. Get to like actual. Get to the meat of the argument. You to believe it, and I'm not going to even try to impose my will. I'm simply saying, as a factual matter, speaking for myself, I was not aware that the numbers had been beyond fifty. When I made that By the statement, way. I will further state, I will further state that to my knowledge, I could be mistaken that I did not make another statement. Critics have labeled Finkelstein poison a self-hating Jew. And I admit, I have said to you, it was a moral quandary for me. And I said in many interviews... That's insane. ...that it was, for me, a very burdened moment... Murat is the one who called it, by the way. I wasn't entirely confident in my moral judgment. And it was at that point that I started to look I'm back... Save this. ...at what the white abolitionists had to say when Nat Turner carried out a slave rebellion and many whites were uh, hacked to death, children were beheaded, and I wanted to see, because I was not confident of my moral judgment, I wanted to see what did the white abolitionists, those who fought against slavery, had to say. And I looked at what William Lloyd Garrison, probably the most famous of the white abolitionists, and he said, horrible things happened during Nat Turner's rebellion, but if you read his statement, he wouldn't condemn Nat Turner or Nat Turner's All right, well, let me ask you, okay, so let me ask you, oh, mm -hmm. let me ask you, okay, listen, I, I've heard you say this before, that analogy, that's fine, but let me ask you, given you now know the scale of what happened, given you know 1,200 people were killed, including 800 or so completely innocent civilians. We, we know that children uh, were killed, that grandmothers were killed, and their deaths face time to their families. We know that over 200 people were, were kidnapped and taken hostage. Given you know the full scale of this attack, I've asked a lot of guests this, these two questions. And All right, I'm come on, get in there. Answer. Do you One, condemn you Hamas? categorize it as a terror attack? And secondly, would you condemn Hamas for what they did? My view is as follows. Number one, as far as the evidence shows now, atrocities occurred on October 7th. The magnitude of the atrocities and the types of atrocities, for example, were children beheaded, were women raped. That remains, so far as I can tell from the evidence, an open question. However, that there were atrocities that occurred my answer is yes. Number two, that's a that's a factual question. Then there well, the question was, was question. it a terror attack? Yeah. Well, atrocities, it seems to me, denotes a terror attack. Okay, thank that's you. That's what atrocities okay. are. Thank you. Okay. So, number two, that's the factual question. And then there is the legal question. As a matter of law, it seems unquestionable that the people who perpetrated these atrocities would be prosecuted and convicted in a court of law. However, I would say on the legal question, I should think that there would be some mercy shown because those who carried out the atrocities were concentration camp inmates. Number three, which I think is the one that concerns you the most, is the moral question. And at a moral level, my view is, my basic precept, we may disagree, my basic precept is that there but for the grace of God go I. 
That is to say, I'm very reluctant to condemn people who are in a position or in a condition such that were I in that position or condition, I'm not sure what I would do. Now, the 1,500 young men who burst the gates of Gaza, they were born into a concentration camp. They lived for two decades in a concentration camp. They had no past. They had no present. They had no future. They had no jobs. Half of them, according to humanitarian organizations, suffered from what's called severe food <clears throat> insecurity. And then on top of that, as I'm sure you know, Piers, because you keep up with the news, periodically Israel goes into Gaza and it mows the lawn. And you know what mows the lawn means. It means a high-tech massacre in Gaza. In 2008-9, Operation Cast Lead. 2012, Operation Pillar of Defense. 2014, Operation Protective Edge. And in each of these high-tech massacres visited on the people of Gaza, in some cases hundreds, in some cases thousands of Palestinians are killed. Okay, and let me in ask fact, you... Just an no, well, let me ask okay. you on that so, point. In light of... And on that point, your, I, I want to finish one, one question yeah. about that. In that period... Yes. In that period... And by the way, I, I've been condemnatory of some of the things you've just talked about publicly. I've tweeted my condemnation of some of these things. Uh, condemnation? I've, I've tried to shine a light on the plight of the Palestinians for many, many years. And I feel that the oppression... Uh, of the Palestinian people for many decades has been absolutely outrageous. So we, on that, we can completely agree. Um, but when it comes to what you're saying here, it seems to me what you're trying to paint is a picture of some kind of moral justification for what Hamas did. And that's where you lose me, because I don't see why there could be any, anyone who can see the scale of what Hamas did on October the 7th and not simply condemn it out of hand. You may also want to condemn some of the response by Israel. That's completely normal. I would say that there are serious question marks about the proportionality of what they've been doing. There's but a difference between calling one a terror attack unconditionally and then saying there's question marks on the other one, what though. What happened on October the 7th was a, a disgusting terror attack worthy of condemnation. Then for me, I find it very hard to then respect anyone's demand for people to condemn Israel and their response. Piers... I'm really, and I'm trying to be candid with you. Number one, I appreciate your humanity. I do. I don't know you from Adam. I'm not a TV or a television or a social media kind of person. I'm a book person. I'm old fashioned. However, I do recall that when that famous moment when Susan Boyle appeared on Britain's Got Talent, and I remember the camera turning to you, focusing on you. I can see what? it in my mind's eye. I saw your eyes narrow. And suddenly, the humanity in you came up. Here is this obscure woman whose talent had gone unrecognized. And if I can speak to that same program, for me, the most poignant moment, the one I carry with me my entire, since that moment... He's such a was fucking boomer, dude. Simon oh my Cowell God. asked... Um, Susan Boyle, well, why haven't you been discovered yet? And she replied, because I haven't been given a chance. And that's how I feel about the people of Gaza. That's how I feel about those young men in Gaza. You ask me why I won't condemn them. Because those young men were born into a concentration camp. They were born into among the most dense population uh, populated places on, on God's earth. Half of the population of Gaza's children, 70% are refugees who were expelled from Israel in 1948 and their descendants. 70% of those of Gaza's youth have no jobs, no future, no nothing. They are Susan Boyle times 10,000. Oh God. Never given a chance and as things looked the night before october 7th when the question of gaza was disappearing from the public stage i will admit to you peers 
I myself have given up on Gaza. In 2020, I decided it's hopeless, it's pointless, I only have a finite number of years left in my life, and it's time for me to move on. And I'll tell you, that was a wrenching decision on my part, because I knew I was abandoning the people who for 15 years I had devoted my life to chronicling every detail of the horror that had been inflicted on those people. And I gave up on them. Okay. And that meant if I gave up, they had no future because I was the last chronicler. Okay, but what of I would say, Gaza. All right, but what I, would I have the only right, book, but, but professor, that's been written on this subject. Respond. Let me respond. He's what not respond, wrong, by the way. He is literally right. He dedicated his entire life to this. People in Israel would say, and what Jewish people would say, particularly who live in Israel, is that they were facing a constant barrage of rockets from Hamas. That Hamas won political power in 2005-6. That they were given a huge amount of money. Uh, and could have this done is great. Whatever they want to this is great. Money, this is where you see the Hasbro talking points get eviscerated by my man. This is like he's going to destroy uh, the Israelis this. over that period. None of this and fucking the Susan Boyle right, shit. They responded in a. They have a far superior military, and they responded in the way that they did. And this cycle has been going on in repeat and repeat and repeat. But where you and I differ about this is that I think what happened on October the seventh was just. Uh, on a different scale to anything we've seen and the way it was carried out. And I just don't think saying that people who have been oppressed, which they undoubtedly were for many years, that that justifies them committing that act of terror. But let's take a break. Let's come back after the break and, and discuss this more. God damn it. Okay. Um, uh, God damn it. He literally fucking, he was just about Wait, to let him yeah. cook. He was just about to let him cook. This is the part. This is the part. This is the part where it was supposed to be like him popping off. Um, yeah, um, so Piers does this every single time. He will have a pro-Palestinian voice on. He will bully him in the first half, like ritualistically fucking, uh, you know, pump him full of as many talking points as possible to be like, yeah, I mean, I did this. I did this myself. I, I know from my own personal experience, like, you called me a baboon in a suit, you know, like irrelevant bullshit. Uh, and you have to, you have to, you have to do everything you can to just stay on message, right? He let he let uh, uh, Norm talk for sure, but he set the conditions. He set the boundaries of what the conversation should be around, and that is still uh, silly. And then he fucking hits him with like a he hits him with like a good question. Finally, uh, a good retaliation. Uh, something to something that Norm can like talk about, which is which is you know he's in the pocket there, and instead of letting Norm cook, he goes boom, fucking cut to commercial break. Now the second half of this interview will be very different. Jenk did it there though. Please, I don't, uh, I don't know about the Shmuley debate. No, he let Shmuley pop off on Jenk in that conversation as well. They literally lowered Jenk's audio. They literally lower Jenks audio and let Shmuley unload on him and say, like, what happens during the breaks? Nothing. You, I don't even talk to him uh, during the breaks. Does he genuinely not have access to a computer and mobile? Does this serious question? Oh, yeah, 100%. Elant News. I'm telling you right now, as someone who has been trying to contact him for the past month, he does not. Professor, just to round off what we've just been discussing. He literally doesn't have that anything. Given you wrote that sub stick, uh, and you, you want... Me to believe Bro, he doesn't that, even have a smartphone. He has a landline. Completely oblivious to the reality of what had happened here and the scale of it. Um, but given you're not now oblivious to that, the guy, why have you not removed that substack? Given the language is so clearly offensive to people, and you based it by your own words on a false premise about what had happened. You know, Piers. How's That's he writing on Substack? He dictates, and, and then his morning, assistants write for him. When I was him. talking to some friends from the UK, I was warned you would ask that question. Uh -huh. I'll honestly tell you, I never fear the truth. I don't. I feel the truth is a very powerful weapon on the side of the oppressed. I never fear it. Now, I'm going to give you the answer. Again, you can or can't disagree with me, or believe me. I was tempted to remove it. I was tempted to, quote-unquote, 
protect myself. I didn't remove it because I thought that's intellectually dishonest. I wrote that statement. It's part of the historical record. <laughs> it's part of the documentary. We're back. We're back record. to him uh, getting fucking and I shouldn't uh, do yelled out. What Stalin used to do. So when he published photographs of the Bolshevik Revolution, he would take Trotsky's picture out. Okay, <laughs> and that's the okay. image. So you won't delete it. That was that's the book. image you, that stuck to me. You, man. Man. I just, so oh, you haven't deleted it. But do, you, do, you, do, do you regret it? Do I regret what? Do you regret the contents of that Substack, given that you now know what really happened? Yes, if it can be misconstrued to mean that I wrote that with full knowledge of what happened, of course I regret it. Okay. However, it remains part of the record. And as a serious Norm scholar... Norm has the same brain disease that I do. I'm not a great scholar. I'm not in the ranks of the great British historians, but I take scholarship seriously. He's very stubborn. I did not is very... want to denature... To false He's very proud, and he doesn't shut the fuck up about whatever the tangent that, that is like let me ask you, let me ask that you, has him uh, right, let me ask you. portrayed in a bad it, light. Okay, but okay, that's fair. Listen, that's your decision. You are the son of. He can't two stop. He can't. I know. I know what he's doing. The here. I'm the same way. Concentration. But you camps. have to fucking move back. You have to move uh, you're, away you're from Jewish this. man. It's stupid. Uh, and you it's know, unproductive. Change the fucking subject. How incendiary that Substack has proven to be with Jewish people around the world. Who many of whom have felt this is the nearest thing to the Holocaust of World War II that they've endured. What your parents like, went through, being revisited on them in these. He asked a question before the outbreak and, and it went away. It's um, gone. What do you feel about them? I mean, how would your parents have felt about you, literally on the day that this happened, talking about heroic resistance, talking about that you will never begrudge the scenes. Uh, that oh. you, the stars in heaven are looking kindly down. Glory, glory. The souls of Gaza go marching on. How would your parents have felt about mm -hmm. that? Coming out of oh my God, he's still camp, surviving the Holocaust of World War II. Oh, he's going to dunk on this. This is a good one. Well, first of all, anything I write, I write with my parents. I have my in mind. parents looking at the screen behind me over my shoulders. Yeah. In a metaphorical sense. I am very conscious every moment of my existence, every moment of my existence goes back to the martyrdom of my family. So it's not as if suddenly you're posing a question to me that never occurred to me. Quite the contrary. His parents are Holocaust survivors, Chatter. That's why it's relevant. 30 years That's why it's relevant to the death, story. I need the moral validation that came from my parents' martyrdom and the extermination of their family. How would my parents have reacted? My guess is if on the first day they heard that inmates in a concentration camp burst its gates, I think my parents would be very pleased at that fact. As the events became clearer, my guess, but this is pure speculation, my guess is my parents would go out with their hearts. Yeah, they were in the Warsaw Ghetto, dude. I mean, come on. To those who burst the gates of the concentration camp and whose lives were destroyed. Now, you will say to me completely legitimately, you would say, well, what would your parents feel about the innocents who were slaughtered in the atrocities on that day? Oh, God, don't go into so how they I'm hate Germans, please. I'm going to give please. you as close please don't an talk about how, as I could give. Please don't talk about how your parents I, still hate I'm Germans to, or hated Germans. I once asked my late mother. Oh, God. I said to her, what was your feeling when you heard that the German cities were being terror bombed during World he's War II. He's gonna... The carpet bombing of the German cities targeting civilians. What was your feeling? And my mother's response to me was, quote, our feeling was, if we're going to die, we're going to take some of them with us. Now that's is... not the most morally elevated statement. I agree. 
And do I good, wish man. my mother had and my father had a heightened sensitivity to German civilian life? I suppose I would wish it. But I will tell you, Piers, to the last day of my parents' life, it was unthinkable that they would have a kind word to say about Germans. And it was unthinkable that I would ever quarrel with them on that point. Okay. I accepted, I accepted that given their life experience, they okay. had the right to hate the people who destroyed their lives. Okay. And the people Professor of Gaza have the right to hate the people who destroyed their lives. Professor Figgelstein, uh, thank you for that answer. And I don't mean to cut you off. We've got uh, another guest waiting to respond to Fuck what your we've guest. been discussing. I'd like Bitch. to get you back on. I feel like we've had a, no! a good conversation. I don't Dude, agree that's with you. It? About some God it, damn it. I got to have this man on. I have to have him on. Holy moly. Come on, Phase Apex. Like to explore more of this with you another time. We got to have Face Finkel on, dude. I want to just is... say one last word. Everybody warned me you wouldn't let me speak, that you would speak over me, you would stop me. I want everybody to know you are eminently fair, you are decent, and you are that same human being whose eyes narrowed as Susan Boyle began to perform. Okay. You have that humanity. The baboon in I his suit. Respect it. Thank you. Professor, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. Well, on says the next, Douglas Murray uh, rejoins me live. From Dude, come response. on. He went to have Douglas Murray on after Norm Finkelstein. Dude, that's insane, dude. That is insane. Norm, we got to, you have to be, you have to stop being so fucking stubborn, my man. I love you, but, and, and I don't even agree with a lot of the things that you've said, especially about like, you know, modern identity politics, but like he, he literally gets followed. He literally gets followed by a straight up British Nazi. Like, oh my, oh my God. Okay, so here's the issue. Here's the issue with this. The issue with this is that like uh, Norm is he's incredible in uh, one issue and one issue only. That is being one of the best, most well versed scholars on the history of. Palestinians and the Palestinian plight, specifically contemporary uh, Palestinian uh, plight. Oh my God, this guy is still begging me to talk about the Rainbow Bridge. Brother, what do you mean? It was a fucking car crash, it seems. Do you want me to cover every car crash that occurs? I don't understand what you want from me. Are you a mobile chatter who still is like, you, you, what happened? Did you like watch the Fox News coverage immediately after and, were, and, and then threw your phone into a ditch and didn't see any of the updates? Stop trying to tweet at Norm. Send him a uh, letter via carry version. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. okay, listen, 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 listen. He, Norm is, is very stubborn. He pops off. He says a lot of stuff that, like, uh, lends itself to being misconstrued. I, I see that in my heart of hearts. I know how that works. I've done things like that time and time again. Obviously, America deserved 9-11. was a famous moment of, of, of such uh, sorts. Uh, Hassan Optics Cuck. No, I, I am literally an optics cuck in the sense that I have been ridiculed and bullied time and time again to, uh, in, in passionate moments in things that I've said. Now, of course, if, if given the bandwidth, I can describe my position and elaborate, but a short, a, a, a short quick, piffy interview with Piers Morgan is not that moment. Now, the issue here is uh, Piers just kind of kept this conversation completely around like uh norm's uh, uh october 7th substack i guess which i haven't even fucking read but i assume and i will be like he is uh he is a very angry person he's a very stubborn person he is a very why do you bring up 9 11 every day this is like the fourth time of you bringing it up sorry i can only i should only uh bring up fourth day in a row kind of uh weird you're right i should only bring up 9 11 uh in the context that uh you think is appropriate how are you a 33-month subscriber and you just come in here and say dumb shit like that? I mean, honestly, you're a 33-month subscriber. What do you mean? Why do you always bring up 9-11 every day? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry I hit more than the, the allotted three 9-11 uh, mentions of the week on the fourth one. Hate the stream when we watch Ben for like three hours, but 
say you're hot and strong and sexy. Thank you. Anyway, um, as I was saying, as I was saying, um, his, um, I believe him when I, when he says he has no access to the information at the time, unlike on the, the day of when he wrote his sub stack and he just like wrote all that because the thing is you can, you can say many things about Norm Finkelstein, but you cannot call him a liar. Okay. Why they hating you right now on Twitter, brother, they hate me right now on Twitter every fucking day. So it's not new. Um, what do you mean? I don't know if you know this, but like Twitter is basically 4chan now. So um, Norm Finkelstein is not online. He's not an online person. He probably didn't have up-to-date information on what the fuck was going on. He should probably waited to write uh, his, his opinion on the matter. But having said that, having said that, um, you can say he's brash. You can say he's rude. You can say he's too proud. You can say he's too stubborn. These are all correct, right? but you can't say he's dishonest. So I do believe him. He has a very strong track record of being honest to a fault and also rude. So when he says like, yeah, I didn't know what the fuck was going on on the day beyond like uh, what I thought was happening. I believe him. There's no reason for me to not believe him. Um, Especially because like he says shit all the time. He's duped it out with BDS back in the day and like lost, a lo lost many allies in the Palestinian cause due to him uh, criticizing boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Like, if he believes something, he will literally go all the way. You know what I mean? He will just go all the way. He doesn't, he doesn't stop. I didn't realize it was like that. Now I just go on there for the laughs. Right. It took a while for the info to fold out. It was probably best you weren't live that day or you to have some clips. Yeah, probably. Um, but uh, it sucks that, like, the entire conversation, you have, like, an like a eminent... Palestine scholar, right? Who is uh, certainly very controversial, but his work stand, uh, speaks for itself, right? Um, his, all of his footnotes, everything that he has, uh, all of the work that he's put in to, to his uh, research. And all you have uh, uh, back and forth is over his like silly ass fucking sub stack. Like, come on, uh, uh, sub stack pose. People who turn around and make this out to be like the most important uh, subject matter that needs to be discussed endlessly, in my opinion, are doing it uh, to, to engage in, in propaganda. It is an intellectually incurious thing to do. You know what I mean? Like, unless you're taking a photo of me. Oh, unless like, it, you know what it's like? It's like having, it's like having Noam Chomsky on to talk about fucking, uh, I don't know, manufacturing consent or any number of different things that he's written, right? And then instead of talking to him about all of these things or even like linguistics, right? You immediately go, remember when you said uh, that uh, you should wait until we find out about the real numbers of the Khmer Rouge um, in like whichever, you know, multiple fucking oh, half a century ago? Like you're, you're, you're not serious at that point. You're just there to like shit smear. Obviously, Piers is very good at doing that in a way where it doesn't come across like he's doing it. Uh, it doesn't come across like he's just moving uh, the the conversation away to a, a to a position that is like um, moving the conversation away to a position that is more favorable to to whatever he wants to talk about. But talking to modern MLK about his infidelity, yeah, that's why Bassem did the best job because he was so good at deflecting. I think Bassem is a trained media figure. That's why it showed. Uh, I think I have, unlike uh, Norm, for example, I think I have uh, a little bit more media training myself. I know how that stuff operates because I myself am a media person and not a fucking scholar. So I can shift the conversation back and reprioritize the talking points um, and, and keep the interview on track and not let it go off the rails or allow it to stay on the track that Piers wants it to stay on. And that's unfortunately what happened with Norm. Would you say the norm is a bit of an ego thing going on? If you don't know anything about Norm Finkelstein, maybe you think he has a bit of an ego thing going on, but this is exactly how he's been. And this is his moment of like vindication after decades and decades and decades of his uh, endless coverage where he's been blacklisted, completely cast aside, shunned by academics, um, partially because he doesn't play the song and dance at all, but... Um, yeah, no, he's, he's definitely, uh, yeah. People mix up conviction and ego a lot is a good way to look at it. He is, uh, incredibly stubborn to a fault, but he's right. 
He's right. And he has been right. He has been right all along. There are things that he's wrong on, but on the issue of Palestine, he's right. Um, all right. Uh, Qatar announces when Israel Hamas truce will begin. We're going to talk about that right now. And then, uh, and then uh, I'm going to go pee right now. Uh, and uh, also the, uh, the real announcement is that at the top of the hour, there's a three-minute ad break. Okay, here. Uh, the beginning of the uh, pause will be 7 a.m. Friday, the 24th of November, and it will last, of course, as agreed, for four uh, days. And uh, the first uh, patch of civilians to, uh, to be released from Gaza will be around 4 p.m. of the same day. They will be 13 in number, all women and uh, children, and uh, those hostages who are from the same families will be uh, put together within the same patch. CNN's Becky Anderson, who was in that press conference, asked multiple great questions. Becky, I think one of the key ones that you asked was, what happens if one side breaches this agreement? What is the result of that? What stood out to you about the answer from, from the Qatari official? It was an interesting answer, wasn't it? He said this has to be a secession of hostilities completely on both sides, on the ground, and for periods of time in the air. And he made it very clear when asked about drones in the air, surveillance drones in the air, he said specifically during the period of the hostages being released, there would be no surveillance drones flown. Um, and we know, um, because we've had two, what, what we might call proof of concept um, episodes where we've seen two sets of uh, hostages released, of course, the American uh, mother and her 17-year-old daughter some weeks ago, and then two to elderly Israeli citizens. We know that there were drones in the air at the time, and what he suggested is that can be very confusing. Um, it can uh, make people feel that, they, that there may be some hostile activity in the air. So, so certainly during the periods of time when the hostages are being released, the air, the skies will be clear. The air space over those hostages will be clear. Let's just be very specific, I think, about what we we learned today, Kaylin, and um, this truce starts at... According to uh, Mohammed Al-Safin, Al uh, uh, who, is, uh, who is, is translating Tamer Hammam's post uh, from, from inside of Gaza, he says the situation is crazy and airstrike every 15 minutes on central Gaza. Mohammed, of course, is, uh, is an Al Jazeera uh, a journalist. Yeah, can you guys stop? Niye burada konuşuyorsunuz abi? Bir şey anlat. Kapatma hayır o zaman çok şey olacak. Ee, e, e, çok sıcak olacak burası. Çünkü sizden kaçmaya çalışıyor. O yüzden burada saklanıyor. Peki. There's literally, like, they're just like having a conversation literally next to where I'm streaming. Okay. Anyway, the situation is crazy. An airstrike every 15 minutes on central Gaza. Eight hours until the ceasefire. Israeli airstrikes are as intense as ever. 7 a.m. local Gaza time, that is 12 a or midnight um, Eastern time, and at some point after 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so 9 a.m. Um, Eastern time, we will see the first 13 hostages. The names of those 13 hostages have now been shared with uh, both uh, the with uh, Mossad on the Israeli side and the reciprocal arrangement, as it were, the release of Palestinian prisoners into um, the um, Palestinians' hands will happen around the same time, although um, Majid al Ansar, the spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here, couldn't say exactly how many hostages would be exchanged. And then after that, every day there will be a list um, shared with both sides on those who will be released every day at around the same time. So let's assume for it to be around four o'clock in the afternoon, Gazan time, uh, for four days. That would take us up to effectively 50 hostages, women and children. After that, Majid al Ansari reminded us that the proposal, the, the, the deal includes a, an opportunity for Hamas to come good on its agreement yeah the dynamic is palestinians die israelis are killed the other dynamic also is that israel has palestinian prisoners 
Hamas has Israeli hostages. Both of these people, whether they are Israeli or Palestinian, get killed. They do not just die. They do not just perish. And both of these people are currently being held hostage. Okay? It does not matter what the framing looks like from mainstream media. This is something that you should always remember. It also is not an Israel-Hamas war. Okay? Another thing that I saw in the news uh, was, was uh, the way that they covered it was like Israeli children were held hostage, but Palestinians are people aged under 18. Here it is from Guardian's own article. Carl Hansen caught this on Tribune magazine. It says, Israelis have children, while Palestinians have people aged 18 and younger. The hostages to be freed are women and children, and the Palestinian prisoners are also women and people aged 18 and younger. Both sides have confirmed. It absolutely is deliberate. I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. Do they do it on purpose? Yes. Spoke too soon? What do you mean? No. This is, this is by design. When they write it, when they write it originally, when they write it like this, I think that the people that are writing it aren't purposefully thinking like, I'm going to manipulate. I'm going to manipulate everyone. The people that write it like this are writing it because that is their genuine perspective. Remember, Orientalist attitudes dictate that in Pakistan, you have bribery, which is true. You do have bribery. But in the Western world, we are not corrupt like Pakistan. We are not corrupt like these Eastern nations. We have lobbying. We have codified our corruption, so it's somehow different than the corruption that you see in other nations. Okay? China and the USSR had work camps. Smelly Roach, thank you for your wonderful contribution and feedback on this broadcast, my friend, um, I do smell incredible. You should ask your mom. Just stop stealing content, maybe three head. My man is my most loyal, diehard, dedicated hate follower since January 6th. Has been clapped time and time again. MasterChef don't need you or your 40K viewers, though. Video games do. Watch Charlie's vid. Ukraine Gigahas. Have you already talked about Trump? Bro is dying, Keck W. No, I want to hear more from his... Uh, I'm going to unban him. I want to hear more of his... Uh, uh, his perspective. So, George Carlin talked Force, about this specifically about smug, Israel. Greedy, well fed white people have invented a language to conceal their sins. It's as simple as that. The CIA doesn't kill anybody anymore, they neutralize people <laughs> or they depopulate the area. The government doesn't lie and engages in disinformation. The Pentagon. Well, yeah, we have a defense. Uh, we, we have a Department of Defense. It's not a Department of Offense. It's not the War Department. It used to be. Now it's the Department Don of Defense. actually measures nuclear radiation in something they call sunshine units. <laughs> Israeli murderers are called commandos. Arab commandos are called terrorists. Contra killers are called freedom fighters. Well, if crime fighters fight crime and firefighters fight fire, what do freedom fighters fight? <laughs> So um, this is framing. This is purposeful framing. Um, it's an important part of, of manufacturing consent. Of course, uh, Noam Chomsky had a wonderful take about this as well. When talking to someone from mainstream media, when talking to someone from mainstream media, remember, what the fuck was it? Uh, does anyone have that clip? Does anyone have the, uh, the, the, the Chomsky clip uh, directly to the face of the interviewer? He said, uh, I don't think you personally believe that you are uh, manipulating the public. If you just believed something else, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be standing in front of me asking these questions. Let's see. Does anyone have it? Does anyone have that? Does anyone have that clip? Yeah, the filter clip. You wouldn't be here if you believed something else. That's what. That's the one I'm looking for. Just go to Zay Twitter. You will find it 10 times over. I know, but I don't want to fucking look through it right now. Here. Here it is. I'm sure you're speaking for the majority of journalists who are trained, have it driven into their heads that this is a crusading, a profession, adversarial, we stand up against power, a very self-serving view. How, how, can you, how can you know that I'm self-censoring? How can you I know that you're self-censoring? I'm sure you believe everything you're saying. But what I'm saying is if you believe something different, you wouldn't be sitting where you're sitting. Yeah. So that's what I believe as well. I think these people that are writing these are not even thinking about it. They're not even second-guessing themselves, okay? Beyond that, there's a style Bible for sure. They do have that to enforce these uh, rules as well. However, having said that, the people that write this stuff, I don't think they recognize it. I don't think they recognize that they're writing it like this, okay? Michael Parenti, you say what you like, 
because they like what you say. Like, do I think Anderson Cooper is deliberately fighting against his own moral uh, values? Like his own, uh, you know, internal assessment of the situation is that like Palestinians are human beings and, and therefore he's constantly trying to change his rhetoric, self-censor? No, he doesn't. He doesn't think that at all. That's why when he talks to the uh, Doctor Stop Borders nurse, right, that worked at Al-Shifa, he doesn't even go, do you condemn Hamas? He uses a very different line of questioning where he's like, well, did they try to rape you? Did they try to rape you? Did they try to be violent to you? They knew you were an American. You're a white woman. Do you think he's doing that? Because he's like, I'm going to use this opportunity to be as racist as I possibly can, despite the fact that I internally believe that like Palestinians are not uh, psychotic rapist monsters. No, he doesn't. He doesn't think that at all. He thinks brown men, likelihood that they're violent. I'm going to do my journalistic due diligence here and ask these questions. Okay. Isn't an editor's job to catch these things? I mean, yeah, an editor's job is to catch these things in, and, and, and massage it in the direction of, of manufacturing consent. A great, the greatest example of this is Van Jones. Van Jones used to be a Maoist third worldist, okay? There are, uh, there are videos of him from college. Do I think Van Jones is secretly still a Maoist third worldist? Fuck no. People who legitimately believe these things are brought up in a culture that reinforces these values and these concepts that's it that's it so no i don't think that these people are like all behaving in this like cynical evil way where they know the truth i think they don't even think about the truth do i think for example richie torres uh, a person that i have called uh, an asshole time and time again do i think richie torres knows what the fuck he's doing no I think he's just a racist piece of shit who doesn't even think about Palestinians and has, fed, has been fed Hasbro talking points, so he churns out psychotic nonsense like this regularly. I said, this is a perfect distillation of how real anti-Semitism is conflated with valid criticism of Israel. The Israeli occupying force West Bank checkpoints are very real and well-documented. Jewish space lasers causing California wildfires, Marjorie Taylor Greene's claim, are not real and an anti-Semitic conspiracy. Why is he conflating the two? Because he doesn't know. I don't think he knows. And many, many Americans don't know either. After all, why would they? Why would they know? That requires being curious, intellectually curious. And most people are intellectually incurious. We are not curious people. We do not want to know. And unfortunately, in this sea of willful ignorance to America's imperialism, to the violent actions that we've taken all around the world, the pendulum swings in the other direction from time to time, and that curiosity turns people into weird conspiracy theorists. It's awful. The craziest part about this is that people responded to him with videos of checkpoints. Ali Welshi personally said, I'm Kenyan Muslim, my wife is Jewish, I was not allowed to go through the checkpoints, she was. But, it, but he took it even further than that. He told the president of J Street, because this, this started when uh, Jamal Bowman talked about his experiences when he went to the West Bank with J Street. J Street is like, uh, you know, J Street has some anti-Zionists in it, but it's mostly just a, uh, a, a soft Zionist, liberal Zionist organization that is supposed to be a counter to APAC's like far-right, ultra-nationalist uh, uh, influence in American politics. And the president of J Street responded to Richie Torres and said, you're wrong, they do have checkpoints. And yes, Jamal Bowman was stopped in Hebron, right? And Richie Torres took it one step further. He retaliated because in the mind of a Christian ultra-Zionist, they know who's Jewish and who's not. Now, of course, Richie Torres is very used to shitting on anti-Zionist Jews on a regular basis, right? But this time, he flipped the crosshairs and directed it towards a, a, the president of J Street, does anyone have the tweet, uh, the back and forth there as well? I can find it on my, I, I literally screenshotted it because I, I just could not believe it before he deleted it. One of the most insane uh, back and forths I've ever seen. Richie Torres responded to Je the president of J.C. Jeremy Ben Ami. Okay. I never said there were no restrictions on Palestinian movement, nor did I say that the real issue is that Jews are prohibited from area A. I simply said, I have never seen signage restricting areas to Jews only, which is like, the funniest thing you could say it's literally like well did they say the n-word 
but this time for, uh, you know, defending the apartheid. Well, nobody said, nobody said the N-word openly, so there can't be any white supremacy here. It's so funny. Show the tweet on screen, please. Hold on, I'm going to try. But uh, some of it has been deleted, and uh, I have also been blocked by Richie Torres, so I can't uh, show you. I love the trip with Jamal Bowman. It's a fact. There are checkpoints in Hebron where security separates who... Oh, hi, this is it, I think. Who can walk where by religion? Other checkpoints keep roads sterile of Palestinians. I've been there dozens of times. Join me, he says, the Richie Torres, and to Amy Paulin, and to uh, Aton Fishberger. Okay? To which Richie Torres replies with, I never said there were no restrictions on Palestinian movement, nor did I say that the real issue is that Jews are prohibited from Area A. I simply said... I have never seen signage restricting areas of Jews only. If the purpose of your trip is to incite hatred for Israel, you're surely succeeding. Now, Richie Torres is so arrogant that he will always be defended by ultra-Zionists and ultra-nationalists, and he's so used to shitting on anti-Zionist Jews that he now feels confident claiming that a Zionist Jewish person who is the fucking president of J Street is a valid target. He can question the dedication of a Jewish Zionist to Israel. That's like, like, think about the arrogance there. Think about the insanity. Like anyone and any, everyone in the minds of ultra Zionist Christians, they can take away your Jew card. They can be like, no, are you an anti-Zionist? No, I'm more Jewish than you. It's crazy. Like, what are you doing? What the fuck are you doing? This reminds me of the false criticisms that I have uh, taken from black Twitter in many respects for shitting on Candace Owens, where people think that I say that Candace Owens is not a real black person or something. I've never said that because that would be racist. It's not up to me, but I can shit on Candace Owens' ideas. Okay. He, on the other hand, is quite literally being like, no, you as a literal Zionist Jewish person actually are inciting hatred for Israel. To which Jeremy Ben Ami responded with, how dare you accuse me of inciting hatred for Israel? My great-grandparents founded Petah Tikva. My grandparents, Tel Aviv. My father and father-in-law fought to create the state. I lost friends on October 7th. My family is called up. Security with guns, not signs, enforce these restrictions. Like, he's like, dog, what the fuck are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> my, my grandparents literally have blood on their hands, okay? My father directly has blood on his hands, okay? You, you fuck kidding me? Did he respond to it or just delete it? No, he deleted it. He's still on the street question too, for your information. I can't see it because he fucking blocked me, that petulant coward. When I traveled to the West Bank, I saw signs prohibiting Israelis from entering Area A. Are there signs? Are there any signs of the territories that restrict access to Jews only? I never saw one. I can't believe he's literally still on this. What a cowardly little baby. After blocking everyone that openly dunked on him, he turned around and is still pushing this fucking narrative. Going, I'm not owned. I'm not owned. Yeah, who do you think put those signs up, bro? You think it was the fucking Palestinians that put the signs up? Ridiculous. Anyway, Richie Torres is not an honest actor here, okay? He is a dishonest actor. That's it. He's dishonest. And uh, there's not much you could do to convince him otherwise that he is in the wrong. It's, it's like that uh, old saying. What is it? Um, was it Huxley who said it? Uh, the, you could not convince a man of something that uh, he's getting paid not to be convinced of when the bag requires him not knowing. <sighs> anyway, Hasanabi is a Twitch actor, so lol. Listen, you can accuse me of many things, but much like Norm Finkelstein, you can disagree with me, but much like Norm Finkelstein, I never shut the fuck up when I believe something is just, okay? To a fault. To a fucking fault. So I, I live by my convictions and I will always defend them. And if that means I lose followers in the process, so be it. I have stood by them over and over again. Oh, it's the Upton Sinclair quote. Sorry. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. You're better on trans issues than Norm? Yes, uh, definitely. For sure. Do you know why there's less and less information about Israel-Palestine war on uh, Twitter? I don't know if that's the case. But anyway... You can't say that and then go, if I can go back in time, I wouldn't admit to being a socialist. I mean, I probably, as you have noticed, I probably still would have inevitably. Anyway, did you order some pokey cookies? I did not. So it would be hard for you not to run your mouth eventually. Exactly. Um, 
Israel's Minister of Communications begins the procedure to shut down the Israeli newspaper Haaretz for being anti-patriotic. Haaretz carried the story about Israeli helicopters shooting civilians on October 7th in Gaza. And now they're trying to take out Haaretz. And I saw some really funny fucking tweets about this where uh, what's that guy who's like former Trumper turned veteran turned uh, lover of the Democratic Party. Uh, I, I fucking clipped that on. God, I'm turning into Joe Rogan. I literally screenshot shit on Twitter. I see now. Where is it? Oh, David Weissman responding to Ali Welshie. Hold on. I'm going to, or yeah, Weissman, David Weissman. Hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to show you this fucking ridiculous take. Oh, here it is. I think this is it. Yeah. Israel's communication minister has accused Haaretz of subverting Israel in wartime, undermining the spirit of Israeli soldiers and residents, and serving as a mouthpiece for incitement of Israel's enemies. Propaganda in the service of the enemy and presenting the narrative of our enemies while presenting lies using anti-Zionist and anti-Israeli terminology and justifying the enemy. Okay? To which this guy said, Haaretz is left-leaning biased media outlet. But this was the cake for me. So they are treasonous or just presenting a legitimate Israeli perspective that should be respected even if it's a minority perspective. Israel holds itself out as a democratic nation aligned with U.S. values, does it not? He said, they're like the Fox News for Israel, if that helps. <coughs> now, obviously, this is kind of funny. If, I guess by David Weissman's own admission, America was like a liberal democracy that genuinely cared about freedom, then Fox News is anti-freedom, anti-liberal democracy, and fascist, right? So yeah, from his own framework, this is correct. They would be like the Fox News of Israel in the, sense that, in the sense that they are carrying out truthful journalism in a fucking fascist nation that is incredibly far-right and incredibly racist. So on that ideological spectrum, if you did believe genuinely, as I assume David Weissman does because he is an army vet, proud Jew, former Trump supporter, former Republican political opinion writer and wrestling fan, if America is this, like, democratic safe haven in the way that, like, uh, he probably believes it is, then, yeah, the ideological opposition to that would be a fascist op-ed uh, place, okay? What? Please accept you're bad at debating. You literally baited yourself into a drama video you couldn't be bothered to watch when it was meant to be on Palestine. You give yourself the stupidest everything they need. You, could, you should stop as it's killing your viewer count slash credibility, says laser username 6. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your consideration, my friend. Yeah, uh, Murad said, I thought today would be a chill day, and he, mo uh, and he walked away from the screen. He's gone. <laughs> I, love, I love dudes that come in here, and they're like, I'm a big fan of yours, and I actually love Palestine. Meanwhile, on their original account, they're literally like, everyone is a Hamas dog that needs to be ruthlessly slaughtered, and I think Hassan is Hamasabi. But then on their sock account, they're like, I actually personally love your coverage, and I'm really sad that you've discredited yourself. <laughs> anyway. Oh, here is uh, Barack Ravid who wrote on this as well. As McGurk was leaving, Netanyahu grabbed his arm and said, we need this deal. The prime minister asked that Biden call the Qatari Emir, Emir again to nail things down. Um, no, there was another thing that he wrote, actually, that I wanted to talk about, where apparently Barack Ravid, uh, when he wasn't, uh, when he was just like, hold on, where is it? Oh, here, 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 here. Wait, did he delete it? What the fuck? Oh, here. He said, a sure recipe for the dissolution of the emergency government in the middle of war... Uh, he said, and then, <laughs> wait, did he delete it? I saw him write in Hebrew, uh, about how, like, how upset he is that, uh, the, the fucking Israeli communication minister saying that was losing Jake Tapper, who is like a very important ally in the Western media. Oh, I think he did delete it. Fuck. Anyway, I saw his tweet earlier this morning. <laughs> Where he was like, he either retweeted someone or he himself personally tweeted, uh, we're losing Jake Tapper <laughs> with this decision. Uh, with the Israel's communication minister, Shlomo Karhi, saying, uh, you know, Haaretz needs, to be, uh, Haaretz needs to be disbanded. He literally was like, we're losing fucking Jake Tapper, who is a very important ally. Oh, yeah, here it is. Shlomo Karai managed to annoy one of the top journals in the U.S. who, since the beginning of the war, had led coverage of the atrocities committed by Hamas on October 7th and exposed them to the eyes of the whole world. <laughs> what a takeaway, dude. It's funny, sure, uh, Haaretz has Gideon Levy and a left-of-center editorial board, but it also has Anshul Pfeffer, no left-winger, and was the journalistic starting point for Fauda, and every young dove I've ever known who worked there has quit. And further funny because, of course, gripping about the biting Jake, uh, biting the Jake Tapper that feeds is inherently funny. Also, I can't stomach the post 10-7. 
patriotic fervor, but these among the people who need to read it if you want to be informed about what's going on within Israel. What is this? Does this guy block me too and I can't see it? I used to genuinely think Anshal was a good voice to listen to in the, uh, and and let last year, and of course since 10-7, quickly, has quickly remedied me of that. Um, um, Norm versus Pierce ended. It's so funny. These motherfucking Zionists are so alike. You can recognize them with a dumbass photo to put as their profile pic. What do you mean? I don't know what you're talking about. I understand what that is. Anyway, we'll do, uh, we're moving away from this and we're doing some fun stuff. I know everybody's like fucking, uh, they're, they're tired of me, uh, endlessly covering, uh, this issue over and over again. Uh, this is the last thing I was going to talk about. Uh, and then we're going to, I mean, when Jenk gets here, when, when uncle Jenk gets here, this is going to turn into a Jenk off. So get excited for that. Um, yeah. Melissa Barrera spoke out after scream seven departure. Silence is not an option. Yeah, I'm going to, we're going to fucking, we're going to have a good old fashioned face off, uncle nephew face off. Oh, and then the other thing I was going to talk about is that the Al Shifa director, uh, hospital director was arrested. Um, so one, one good arrest, one bad arrest. You know what I mean? Ex Obama advisor has been arrested after footage emerged of him harassing an Egyptian street vendor for supporting Palestine. He was arrested on preliminary charges of hate crime slash stalking, second degree aggravated harassment, stalking, causing fear, stalking and employment. Okay. I'm going I'm to keep it a buck 50. I think if this also could be translated to cyber stalking, I could get like 5,000 people arrested, like minimum. Like the things that he said to this guy every day, I hear online pretty much every fucking day, like every fucking day. People come in here. Uh, they try numerous different versions of this exact same shit. I would literally, I could get 5,000 people fucking arrested on these exact same charges, stalking and employment, stalking, causing fear, second degree, aggravated harassment, hate crime and stalking. Oh my God, dude. That should be awesome. Stuart, Stuart, what do you want to say about to the Muslim community about your remarks, Stuart? Muslim community. Anyway, bozo, bozo. Um, here's what Melissa Carrera said, by the way, or Melissa Barrera, sorry, has released a statement after she was uh, fired from Screen 7 for being vocal about the genocide happening in Palestine. Silence is not an option for me. First and foremost, I condemn anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. I condemn hate and prejudice of any kind against any group of people. As a Latina, proud Mexicana, Mexicana, I feel the responsibility of having a platform that allows me the privilege of being heard, and therefore I have tried to use it to raise awareness about issues I care about and lend my voice to those in need. Every person on this earth, regardless of religion, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or socioeconomic status, deserves equal human rights, dignity, and of course, freedom. I believe a group of people are not their leadership and that no governing body should be above criticism. I pray day and night for no more deaths, for no more violence, and for peaceful coexistence. I will continue to speak out for those that need it most and continue to advocate for peace and safety, for human rights and freedom. Silence is not an option for me. She's fucking awesome. Did you see the stuff about him being a former advisor and working on Israel policy for Stuart? Yes, uh, I covered it. I covered it extensively, as a matter of fact, when it happened. I assume that we put it up. Yes, we did. Here's the video. This guy worked for Obama from one day ago. You can go watch it there. Uh, he has now been arrested. So uh, I want to get Melissa Barrera on stream. I don't know if I can. Uh, I can go through some of my friends to see if we can get him. We can do that. Um, when will you have Frogan on for your end? Um, maybe. Cringe loser says shanks pirate brother this is this is uh, a, a day of celebration for you i hope um i would have suspect, suspected that all of my haters are at the very least like you know spending their day thanksgiving day uh not trapped in their fucking basement away from their families and in here angry i hope you have a great thanksgiving i hope uh you know you have some some friends and family that you can reach out to jesus christ also, weird that you have a One Piece username and you hate on me and also, I suspect, Palestinians. Pro-Palestinian activists glued themselves to the street and delayed the Macy's Parade this morning? Yeah, I saw that. You can have Hera and Susan Sarandon on at the same time? I can. Yeah. Imagine siding with the fucking Marines while being a One Piece fan and siding ideologically with the fucking admirals, dude. And the bad ones, not even the good ones. Because the good ones quit. You know what I'm saying? Yes, I did see Susan Sarandon's son's post. Susan Sarandon and her son are both Hassan Abi heads. Um, he said, okay, I'm really grateful to see people on Twitter defending my mom amidst the new era of McCarthy's blacklisting, but can you please stop using the clip of her getting her hair done with her honkers out? This guy goes, those honkers fed you. 
have some respect, which is the greatest fucking reply I've ever read. It's so fair. It's so valid. There's not really much you can say about that. God, I love Twitter so much. This is like, you know, as much as I hate the fucking platform and what it has become, these are the types of things that happen on this platform that I absolutely love and I can't let go of. So, Jenna Ortega exited Scream 7 after firing a Melissa Barrera over Palestine post, and Ortega is reportedly unable to film the sequel due to scheduling conflicts with Netflix's Wednesday. Jenna Ortega, on the other hand, has also been very vocal about uh, uh, being pro-Palestine, as you guys know. Um, so this led to people speculating that she actually dropped out due to her perspective and due to Melissa Barrera being, uh, fired. However, I do think that this is still misinformation. Like that speculation is incorrect and that she literally, uh, dropped out of the sequel due to scheduling conflicts with the second season of her hit Netflix series Wednesday, in which she plays Wednesday Adams of the Adams family. The independent has contacted representatives of Ortega and Spyglass, on Tuesday, 21st of November, a spokesperson confirmed to Variety that Barrera had been fired after her social media posts were interpreted as anti-Semitic. By the way, for those of you who want to know, what was considered anti-Semitic out of Melissa Barrera's takes? Because they said, we have zero tolerance for anti-Semitism or the incitement of hate in any form, including false references to genocide, ethnic cleansing, Holocaust distortion, or anything that flagrantly crosses the line into hate speech, a spyglass spokesperson told the publication. Well, let me tell you, Care to find out what it was that was considered so offensive? Sure hope it wasn't famous Israeli Holocaust scholar, genocide scholar, Roz Seagull's Jewish Currents magazine article that she posted on her story where he talks about how the situation in Gaza has the makings of ethnic cleansing. Sure hope it's not something as fucking ridiculous as that. Oh, no. Oh, no. Uh-oh. It turns out, yes, it exactly is that. Turns out she got booted from the franchise for reposting Israeli genocide scholar Ross Segal's words in the Jewish Currents magazine calling Israel a textbook case of genocide. Not even her statements, but instead this. The assault on Gaza can be understood in terms of as a textbook case of genocide unfolding in front of our eyes. I say this as a scholar of genocide who has spent many years writing about Israeli mass violence against Palestinians. I've written about settler colonialism and Jewish supremacy in Israel, the distortion of the Holocaust to boost the Israeli arms industry, the weaponization of anti-Semitism, accusations to justify Israeli violence against Palestinians, and the racist regime of Israeli apartheid. Now, following Hamas's attack on Saturday and the mass murder of more than 1,000 Israeli civilians, the worst of the worst is happening. That blows my fucking mind. What do they mean, the distortion of the Holocaust? Oh, that is Roz Segal's own writing where he writes about the distortion of the Holocaust specifically to drive up Israeli arms. That it, there's a link there if you see it. Okay, here it is. If you want to follow it or if you want to give it a read, it's on The Nation. Distorting the Holocaust to boost the international arms trade. If whitewashing Bulgaria's history during the Second World War helps an Israeli arms company get a contract... Who could possibly object? Written by Ross Segal and Amos Goldberg. <sighs> Yehuda Shahul uh, uh, reveals breaking news. Leaked IDF Shin Bet memo. Israeli police are not enforcing the law on settlers in the West Bank under the instruction of the National Security Minister Ben Gvir. <laughs> We revealed this evening. Jesus Christ, dude. I mean, it's not surprising. We revealed this evening, as you said, an extraordinary document, which was placed in front of the chief of staff, along with an opinion by the head of the Shabak, which states that the Israeli police, based on the impressions of senior Shabak officials, does not handle Jewish terrorism in the territories, and that is because of the direction, a directive from the minister, of national security, Itamar Ben Gvir. The document was written by Commander Central Command Yehuda Fox with the goal of warning that he doesn't have in his view the tools to deal now with the nationalist crimes of right-wing elements in Judea Samaria. As mentioned, this is a secret document that only a few saw. And General Fox has mentioned attached to his document. Also the opinion of senior Shabak officials and they make an, an amazing statement. According to this document, the Shabak said that the police in reality hardly enforce right-wing nationalist crimes. Oh my God, I'm so shocked to find this out. Guys, that's crazy. I can't believe it. I can't believe that the, the West Bank is, is basically a fucking free-for-all. You know? 
Talk like this? Why? Why are people able to? This person is not even a fucking uh, a sub. How is he sending me? It's a directive of the minister Ben Gibir. It is his order for the senior command of the police, more accurately the Judea and Samaria district, to abstain from enforcement against right-wing elements. The documents also detail specific cases of events in which Shabak gave information and there were no arrests and or there was an immediate release. It speaks of one case which the world which the word revenge was written and still the event was de not defined as a nationalist crime. In the bottom line, it is far-reaching claim that the minister Ben Gavir instructs the Judea and Samaria police to abstain from enforcement against nationalist crimes and not to deal with enforcement against right-wing elements. And the outcome, according to the claim and commander of Central Command of the Shabak said, this is literally clan shit, by the way. I hope you understand. Yeah, Apex Twizy, you are going to get fucking ass clapped, I promise you. I'm not clicking on that fucking link. And that they have no ability to deal with this event and to prevent igniting the territory, which is, of course, the last thing we need now. We didn't get a response from the Shabak, but Shabak officials we spoke to mentioned that, indeed, the commissioner, Shabtai Levi, is not a part of the situation and is working to fix it at least partially. Can't believe this many people watching propagandas. Brother, I am literally watching Israeli news off of a fucking Israeli uh, activist group who is... The guy is Israeli. He's the co-founder of fucking Breaking the Silence Israel. He's a former IDF veteran. <coughs> He's now the co-director of OFEC, another Israeli activist group, who is showing us Israeli television, uh, an Israeli television program, <coughs> where Israeli journalists have uncovered memos from the Israeli interior security that are directly fucking shitting on the, the interior minister, Itamar ben Gavir, who is a far-right Jewish supremacist terrorist declared a terrorist by the Israeli government, by the way, until he became uh, more prominent of a political force in Israel. And you look at that and you go, that's propaganda. I can't believe this many people are watching a propaganda. Propaganda in this circumstance, if you want to use it in the correct terms, would be propaganda that is ultimately truthful dissemination. Okay? I am engaging in information dissemination that is truthful. Do you understand? But you cannot live with that reality. That reality breaks your fucking brain. Okay? That's crazy, man. That's crazy. How do you come in here and go, this guy is a propagandist and he's lying instead of actually looking at what I'm saying and looking at the sources of where this is coming from? I know it makes you feel better, okay? I know it makes you feel better to just go, yeah, this guy's lying. I can't believe so many fucking people are just lying. Uh, so many people are watching this like liar, right? It's crazy. Propaganda doesn't mean truth value. It can be emphasis. Exactly. It sucks. I urge you to be, if you're a hater on this beautiful day, instead of hanging out with your fucking family, you're in here looking for an opportunity to shit on me, just be charitable, please. Your perspective will shift. I know you have been so predisposed to just fucking be like, Hassan sucks, Hassan sucks. But if you listen to my words and if you listen honestly and see honestly where my sources are coming from, you will recognize that I am not fucking lying to you. Okay? They even claim that there's been a decrease in uh, nationalist incidents. By the way, they did do that in the news, which was ridiculous. What do you think about Rosa Luxemburg? I love Rosa Luxemburg. But it should be said that they count both incidents against Jews and Palestinians. And the minister Ben Gavir, in his response to us, does not deny the fact that he gave such a directive. Oh my God! Kid Furry. Yeah, Lennon loved Rosa as well. I love Rosa. Rosa is my queen. Kid Furry, thank you for the 20 gifted subs. He says the false media campaign regarding settler violence continues in full stream. The enforcement against the real criminals, those who throw stones and Molotov cocktails every day in order to kill Jews. This enforcement will continue even more strongly. Said the Minister of National Security. So I love that at the end of this, uh, we find out Itamar Ben Gavir hasn't even fucking denied it. So yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, dude, one of the funniest things I saw on Twitter earlier was this. Bro, that's totally a Jew tunnel. I can tell by the markings. 100%, bro. Trust me. It's pretty funny to fucking try and, like, soy jack me when you most likely look like shit and will never post your face online. I know that, like, the ugliest haters of mine universally 
uh, try to do this thing, which is awesome because it's like you're just demonstrating where your fucking brain is at that point. I, I feel like it's the inverse of of uh, the Trump lovers who like portray Trump as like this sexy guy in great shape. You know what I mean? And this is like when you hate me so much that you're like, you're so ugly. Look, I posted you in an ugly way. It's just the saddest cope I've ever seen. But he go, the gayest now goes, how badly is her life have to have gone to be making shit like this? Now, the hilarious part about this is I literally never even, I wasn't even discrediting what the IDF was saying. So this, in my opinion, unironically shows exactly how my haters operate, where they don't even hear what I'm saying. I said literally the exact opposite of what this, uh, what this hater claims I was saying, which is that it very likely is a Hamas tunnel. Like there's a likelihood that these were built by Hamas. It is consistent with other tunnels that the IDF has found that are Hamas tunnels. It's so funny. Why are you giving this airtime? There are schizo posting. I just, I don't, I, I'm giving you airtime because it's so funny to just literally take a position that I'm not even holding and act like I said the exact opposite. It's just, I don't know. It, Twitter is 4chan, yes, 100%. And it's just like an endless circle jerk of people being like, I take it back, this guy's life has gone even worse, bro. That's definitely a Hamas eggplant. Put that thing in my mouth. Sad, this is uh, sad that you have no rebuttal to the criticism other than to insult the person criticizing. <laughs> Uh, it's so awesome. Yeah, just schizo posting, except it has 300,000, uh, 377,000 views. I know. Yeah. Please debate this soy jack is like, please debate this soy jack uh, about a person that you probably don't even fucking watch that you don't know what he said. Uh, and, and uh, you know, this is the criticisms that we have. You don't have anything for these criticisms. It's like, dude, what are you, are, are you, are you lacking this level of self-awareness? Like, I get it. I understand that, uh, you know, Twitter has basically turned into fucking poll, 4chan poll, but it's pretty funny to think that, like, other people are just as brain broken as you just because you have, like, a very vocal, uh, marginal community that does prop this shit up. It's like going on LSF and seeing people argue about how, like, my anti-white sentiments are the most are the highest form of racism that one can ever withstand and one has ever seen. And like, yeah, sure, in that community, it seems to be the case that like you say something uh, that uh, that is, is is translated to like anti-white behavior. It doesn't even matter if you yourself are white. Um, people will say that is the most that is the worst racism that anyone's ever heard. It's just, I think a lot of people uh, get trapped in their own hug boxes and they it causes them to lose sight of uh of, of what the broader majority and their feelings are which by the way in many instances is uh it can be very reactionary and very racist certainly but like they also lose sight of what is right in that situation like they just completely let go of of any kind of moral uh, framework that they may or may not have had and they try to rationalize their their weird inappropriate oftentimes schizophrenic ramblings some people will be like don't say any slurs guys why do we say slurs and then go saying all kinds of slurs when it's not about you lamount no they say all kinds of slurs about me too that's the funniest part here's gert wilders speaking at a twinks for trump party check out the art oh man 2016 was such a wonderful time yeah when the c-word gate saga made it to the other subreddits and that's like reddit you know what i mean not exactly the best place for um getting your uh, political perspective. But when it made it its way to other subreddits, everyone was like, what the fuck are you guys talking about? Like, shut the fuck up. Anyway, um, I don't know what the fuck is going on in Dublin, all right? But they're lighting shit on fire, apparently due to, uh, uh, related to a stabbing, it seems. It's a far-right rally or far-right riots occurring in Dublin. I, I don't know. I don't know anything else that's going on other than shit's on fire. Uh, C word gate was two years ago around this time. That's how I made it to this lovely community. Saw you on majority report. Cool stuff. Hell yeah. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. Um, but, uh, it seems not great. Innocent children ruthlessly stopped by a mentally deranged non-national in Dublin, Ireland today. Our chief of police had this to say about the rise in the aftermath. Drew, not good enough. There's grave danger among us in Ireland and it should never be there in the first place. And there's been zero action done to support the public in any way, shape or form with this frightening act. Not good enough. Make change or make way Ireland for the victory. God bless those attacked today. We pray. 
Irish Garda Commissioner Drew Harris is condemning the disgraceful scenes in Dublin. He claims that the hooligan faction driven by far-right ideologies beyond the violence in the streets. Yeah, I don't... It's not good. Great conclusion. Well, I don't know what the fuck is going on. So I don't care uh, to, to report on this at the moment because I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was actually a non-national that fucking uh, uh, stabbed a kid. All we know is that... All we know at this moment is what people think is happening. So I don't like covering shit like that. Classic lol covering not conferred news. You mean confirmed. See, this is why, this is why it's most likely not like um, built by Israel or some shit as, as people originally suspected because Israel had built uh, some of the tunnel structure underneath the hospital because you cannot put a fucking patient through this hole. Like there is no utility in this situation. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I don't think my, I don't think my haters care. I think they just like, at this point, is a fucking circle jerk off of uh, whatever their speculation is. You can be more clear and objective when you talk about the sensitive topics. Shut the fuck up, bitch. Wait, what? Disgraceful and ignoble of Piers Morgan to allow Douglas Murray to insult and defame the most personal terms his guest, Norman Finkelstein, without the slightest challenge. Piers Morgan is a coward and a weakling for not having the decency to put the counterpoint. It was Pierce Morgan who asked Norman Finkelstein about his parents' experience in the Holocaust. Norman answered. Then afterwards, once Norman had gone, Douglas Murray accused him of weaponizing his parents' experience. Yet Pierce Morgan did not challenge this. Pathetic. You know, it's really ironic that Douglas Murray is saying that. Your haters don't care that you want to gloat about their perceived win. Yeah, except they are gloating a little too hard. And I think people are noticing that the stands behaving in like this incredibly, like stands of other content creators who are just like haters of mine. They're behaving in like incredibly inappropriate ways and kind of showing their ass to the rest of Twitter. And now you have like all the Twitter shit stirrers uh, responding to them and, and starting to shit on them pretty aggressively. I've never seen it before uh, in ways that I had never seen. You're letting them derail and kill your stream. Just ignore them for the love of fuck. You're right. I should. And I will. Israel's war puts Douglas Murray's sick views on full shot. I don't want to watch that. Uh, anyway... I feel like this unhinged hate towards you has gotten since, uh, gotten worse since the war. Yes. Anyway. Bro, you gotta be more careful with the edgy jokes you make. I just found out someone who's a huge hater because of a clip chimp joke you made about date rapes on the anti-woke campus. Yeah, there's not really much I can do about situations like that because, um, you know, if someone wants to cut... Dude, there are a shit ton of people who think I'm, like, also in support of, uh, you know, baby uh, murder. What do, you, what do you want me to do? Like, there... The only way to avoid that is uh, just not speaking ever. You know what I mean? The only way to avoid the top of the hour ad break is by subscribing for $5 or for free. But the only way to avoid not getting clip chimped is to just never speak at all. Your biggest haters have no morally consistent narrative regarding this conflict, so all they have left is shit slinging. Yeah. For me, I think it shows uh, perfectly that like the only ideological value the only like rudder that is guiding many of the people who hate me is just like anti-hassan shit and not necessarily any sort of like real ideological disagreements it's more so like i don't really care about anything i just want to fucking see you crash and burn like i hate you classic um all right let's move on to some fun shit though yeah anti-hassanism i did see this and now nah, people are actually just racist i mean it's a it's a collection it's a collection of, of different um, takes. Why did you ban Kira, though? What? Ban Kira? I don't even know what the fuck you're talking about. This account should be removed for promoting blatant misinfo. As soon as this incident happens, it's more on spouse terrorism. And a few hours later, when all the facts come out, it's just a car accident. What the fuck happened to finding the facts anymore? This is good. I'm glad that he's coming after fucking uh, libs of TikTok. I've done my research on Reddit. Now that we have established that you are one of the founders of Hamas and stream from under the Shiva hospital complex made in might be by Khan Yunus depends on your mood. Do you plan on developing ties to the Islamic Jihad? Your career would take off. Yeah. Um, I said, I'm moving on. Jank is supposed to be here at this point and I don't know where he is. And therefore I don't know what to move on to. You know what I mean? I had, I think I read it was a Tesla. It's not, I thought it could have been a Tesla as well, given how uh, Tesla's sometimes have a tendency to catch on fire. It's not. What is this? I'm thankful that I just beat my kids in our first board card game day. New tradition at the Uyghur household. Board games on Thanksgiving. To be fair, my son beat me at 26, 28 in Madden earlier in the morning. But does that really count? Happy Thanksgiving. Bro, why is he tweeting like this? Don't say I just beat my kids, man. People are going to fucking... Oh, God. I like that I said I'm moving on the fun stuff. And someone said, have you covered the latest anti-trans bill in Florida? <sighs> no, I have not. 
Thank you for streaming out. Thanks, even. I just lost my uh, granddad a couple weeks ago. Shortly after he was diagnosed with aggressive brain cancer, he was a union man. Thank you for helping me get through another Thanksgiving day. Tough Thanksgiving day. Well, that's what I'm here for. Um, here, there was a, there was a, uh, a, 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 a Lizzy or it was, was sending a baklava video. What about the hospital director? No, I'm not going to cover the hospital director now. Play the scary game. I could do that. I could start with a fucking scary game. Cheater or I get on? big F boy vibes from you. Be for real. You're a cheater. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how I feel about these uh, cut videos sometimes. Baklava's historical journey, a recipe in question. Is it Turkish or Greek? Okay, first of all, ridiculous. It's Turkish. Anyone that says it's Greek is fucking lying. Okay, they're a liar. They're lying. Uh, this shouldn't even be a question, okay? Welcome. Today I'm in Gaziantep. The this motherfucker went to where Baklava was literally popularized to ask this silly ass question, bro. Part of food culture in Turkey. When I first came to Turkey, the first thing people told me when we talked about food was, you must go to Gaziantep. And I can't wait to see and taste all the flavors that's going on. Bro will watch something for three hours and not like it instead of playing any fucking thing. Okay, first of all, bro, I did play fucking Alan Wake last night and I want to play Alan Wake again. But what is deeply frustrating to me is that the moment that I fucking start playing a video game, everybody leaves. What do you want? What do you want from me? Yeah, this is my last vid. If Jank is still not here, I'm going to fucking move on to Alan Wake. I don't give a fuck if every single person leaves. I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want to do. Stop saying we view count Andy. It's my fucking job, dickhead. It's my fucking job. Okay? Now, one of the places you have to come to is the Coppersmith Bazaar, which is where I am now. You've got all these soaps. You've got metalwork. You've got pottery. You've got food, of course. But I'm only here for one type of food, baklava. And I want to have one question answered for me. Is it Greek or is it Turkish? Oh god, I love baklava so much. Gaziantep sits right at the heart of Turkish culinary culture, and it's not hard to see why. It sits right at the crossroads. Yeah, Alan Wake was incredible, cultures. by the way. You've got Georgia and Armenia to the north, Iran and Iraq to the east, Syria and the Middle East down to the south. Now, we're going to find out later in the show whether baklava belongs to Greece or Turkey, but what we do know for sure is that baklava is right at the heart. The green dust thing is pistachio, my friend. It's crumbles of pistachio. Mm. Antep, Gaziantep, is famous for pistachios. There's a lot of uh, pistachios there. Turkish culture, and particularly celebrations, festivals, weddings, baklava is always served. Baklava is mid Victoria sponges also to tier. Okay, dude, for that, you definitely need a minute off at least. And they say here something that I agree with. If I could, I would have baklava for three meals a day. Now, I'm not going to take that advice because I don't want to die before I'm 40, but it is delicious. Oh. You gotta have baklava from Gaziantep and the dondurma from Marash, okay? Uh, Marash, Karaman Marash, is the area where they make Turkish ice cream. It has a, uh, it has a sukkas, I guess, right? Like it, it it's, it's very uh, stretchy. It's like gummy. I don't know how else to describe it. Like real Turkish ice cream is the best, dude. Oh my fucking god! It has gum in it. Yeah. Later today, I'm gonna be looking to see whether baklava. Is a Greek or a Turkish dish, but before we do that, we've come here to the Zeugma Mosaic Museum to look at some of the most incredible mosaics you're going to find anywhere. Some of these going back as far back. Okay, okay, okay. Get to the bottom, man. Antep pistachio, absolutely delicious, crammed Mastic. in there inside the yufka. Now, to make it really, really good, everything has to be from Gaziantep. The butter, the syrup, the people who make it, the ovens, everything. And right here in Gaziantep, we're at Kocak one of the best and most well-known sellers of baklava in the whole of Gaziantep. The only problem with baklava is like, much like donuts, it is just like, it is so insanely fucking calorically dense. Like it is, oh, it's so bad. Let's go inside and see what they've got. Ooh, okay, 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 uh, I love everything. Okay, there's another thing that I love here. Um, that right there is unkurabiyesi. Okay, it has a little pistachio in the middle of it. That is not a baklava. That is a, a cookie, a Turkish cookie. Um, and oh my God, unkurabiyesi is incredible. It's it's called flour cookie. Oh, abi unkurabiyesi deytir. Oh God, all the Turks in the chat being fucking ridiculous. It it's kind of reminds me a little bit of the uh, mosaics we saw at the Zugma Museum. Each one really is a work of art and 
culinary poetry, each one. And you know, in Gaziantep, they take their food seriously. If you were to say no to some of the offerings here, you might not leave the city alive. Darbuka oh. is the look at all this delicious instrument that they're uh, right playing here. With. Now, the baklava that we know and that you see right here goes back to the Ottoman period the drum. just after the conquest of Istanbul, where you can find recipes for it in the notebooks of the top Kappa Palace going all the way back to 1473. But obviously, baklava and the food culture itself goes way back, right back to when man first started walking and went, oh, I'm really hungry. Only joking, but not that much, because if we go all the way back to the 8th century BC in the Assyrian Empire, there are historians that have found records about something approximating baklava, about unleavened bread being filled with nuts and honey, which sounds basically what we've got here. Anyway, now we have to see how we make it, how we go from the kitchen to the table. Oh, oh my so God. So for centuries, the Turks were a nomadic people traveling around, which meant they couldn't have things like a traditional oven for cooking dough. So what they did instead was cut these thin strips like this and put it onto a fire and cook it. Now, when the Turks came to Anatolia in the 11th century, they brought with them something called Baku Paklavasa, or what we would know as Baklava. But with all this evidence of the Turks bringing Baklava to Anatolia... That's just straight sugar water, dude. Oh my God, that syrup, oh my Lord. Oh, şerbet, şerbeti yatırılan tüm tatlılar kötü bence. Asit bir lan! Anatolia, how come it is that the Greeks have laid claim to it all? How could the Greeks have laid claim to it? Because that's what happens when you have no fucking culture. Just kidding, Greeks actually have very robust culture, but like not enough good food. That's what it is. Hello, welcome to, you know, I mean, look at Israeli cuisine. Now, Professor Spiros Veronis talked about the Byzantine dessert cup tea and equates it to baklava. But there's some crucial differences going on here that were found out by American journalist Charles Perry, who says there isn't the thin layer of dough which characterizes baklava and makes kupte more like a candy, more than, you know, a dessert, so to speak. Now, the Turkish origins, as long with the Arabic origins, have also come in in an old cookbook, Al-Kitab Al-Wusla Al-Habib, apologies to my Awful uh, pronunciation. What is that? There. The love of Wusla? The book of the love of Wusla? What does that mean? Uh, but there was the Arabic and Turkish origins in that book, including the word tutmach, a Turkish word, one of the ingredients inside baklava. Okay, so I'm speaking to Mr. Kolchak here, the owner of this whole establishment and the father of all this delicious baklava here. Now, he knows a thing or two about baklava. Will you be covering the attack on school children in Ireland and subsequent rioting? Uh... <laughs> It's a very interesting way of framing what is happening in Ireland, but I don't know what's going on. It's breaking. I'm not going to cover it. Can you tell me about the, the origins of baklava? Whether I'm not going to cover it, Greek it yet. Or Turkish, basically. Evet, Gaziantep baklavasının başkası biri tarafından mukayese bile edilmez, kabul edilmez, <laughs> tartışma kabul etmez. Bu topraklarda doğmuştur. Bu topraklar. That's so funny. He, it's indisputably border this territory. No, he literally says you can't compare it. It's, it's in, I do, he's right. Doğru. Doğru diyor abi. Adam doğru diyor. Doğruya doğru arkadaşlar. Bunların ürünüdür. Tamamıyla emek hırsızlığıdır. Öyle bir talep. Ve Avrupa Birliği <gülüyor> Emek hırsızlığı. Uh, and it's been granted a geographical Doğru, distinction by the European almıştır. Union. Türkiye adına, Gaziantep adına tescil edilmiştir. Gaziantep baklavasını değerli eden bu topraklarda yetişen ham maddeyle değer kazanmıştır. Tam bunun yerini hiçbir bölge, hiçbir ülke tutmaz. E, bu bölgede yetişen dünyada eşi benzeri olmayan aroma ve rahiye bakımından Antep fıstığı. Yeah, he's saying that Antep pistachios are localized to this region, is regional is region specific and and that's how you make the baklava, which is true. That's like the main primary ingredient bu, there too. Bu bölgenin tereyağı, bu bölgenin buğdayı ve bu bölgenin emeğiyle, bu bölgenin sanatıyla bütünleşmiş bir üründür. Hiçbir yer böyle bir şeye sahip çıkması tartışma bile götürmez. Bu toprakların ürünüdür. Antep baklavası buraya aittir. Burada doğmuştur ve en lezzetli, en kaliteli şekli de burada üretiliyor. So the word baklava came into English in 1650 from the Ottoman Turkish word. But where the Ottoman Turkish word comes from, we don't really know yet. There's a historian Paul Bell who suggests that it's a Mongol word bela, which means sort of to pile up or Another historian of the Turkish Etymology Dictionary 
Sevan Nishanyan suggested it could be bakla or bakla, which means to sort of package, which is where some other sources have said it might come from too. Either way, it's absolutely delicious. I've been waiting all day to eat this, and it's been sat here taunting me while I've been wanting to eat it. Now, I've been told that this piece of baklava here, the classic bit of baklava, we've been eating it uh, the wrong way. We need to turn it upside down so it sticks to the top of your palate and stays there and gives you all that delicious flavor. So let's give it a go now. Mm. Well, it certainly sticks to the inside of your mouth. That's for sure. And the flavor is unbelievable. You guys want to hear something else that's crazy? People are going to say this is anti-Semitic, but it's not. Pastrami, someone in the chat mentioned it. Pastrami and its originations is also Turkish. Although pastrami in the Western world and the way that you understand it, especially in like delicious places like, you know, cat's delicatessen, uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, is a, uh, I think like a Romanian, right? Romanian invention. However, the originations, because it's Eastern European cuisine, American Jewish cuisine, New York City cuisine. However, it's, it's origins actually come from pastirma, which means bastirma, which is like derived from pressing. And we have, you, you about to lose all the New York Jews with that one? No, no, no. It's different. Here's why it's different. Because pastirma, unlike pastrami, is about the curing process. Uh, nomadic Turks uh, that came from the steppes did not have a lot of time to, to uh, you know, sit down. They, they, they rarely ever uh, developed agrarian uh, societies where they, you know, went out to the pastures or whatever. So... Uh, what they used to do is figure out new curing techniques so that they could keep their meat fresh on horseback. And the way to, uh, the way to cure the meat was by uh, pressing it with uh, spices so they could easily access it on the saddle, so, similar to beef jerky, actually, but not, uh, not like beef jerky. You got all the butteriness. The syrup, the honey, and obviously the Antep, the Gazi Antep pistachios. Really, really delicious. Very sweet. If you only listen to anything I say, just one thing, try baklava. It really is delicious. It's so and good. Baklava is so good. From speaking to Mr. Kocak. Oh, yeah, here, look. Uh, the name pastrami comes from the Turkish pastirma, derived from the Turkish Azerbaijan verb pastirma, which means to press. Wind-dried beef had been made in Anatolia for centuries and Byzantine dried meat is thought by some to be one of the forerunners of pastirma in modern Turkey. Pastrami was introduced to the United States in the wave of Jewish immigration from Bessarabia and Romania in the second half of the 19th century. The modified pastrami spelling was probably introduced in imitation of the American English salami. Among Jewish Romanians, goose breads were, uh, breasts were commonly made at the pastrami because they were available. Beef navel was cheaper than goose meat in America. But um, like the word and its origination come from uh, pastirma, like I said. Turkish pastirma, which is this. And the, the outside layer of this is incredibly seasoned. It's air-dried. Uh, it's a way of curing the meat uh, so that you can have it on horseback. It's way too sweet. You mean baklava is? Pastirma is very spicy. The outside curing is very, very uh, spicy. You're not supposed to eat it in, uh, in a lot of instances, but you can. I eat it. And when I say spicy, I mean like... It's like super salty. It's super bitter. It's not hot usually. It's very bitter. It's, it's uh, overpowering. Yeah. It's cured by pressing garlic and spices and cayenne chili and seasoning. Bastirma is very good. It's Arab, not Turk. Stop. No, this literally, what I'm describing is like, there is enough. Um, no, there is definitely enough. Uh, uh, you're riling up the Turks in the chat. Some say Bastirma originated in ancient Armenian cuisine where it was known as abuk. According to Johannes Coder, an expert in Byzantine studies, paston could mean either salted meat or salted dish. Well, acropaston meant salted meat. Other scholars have given different accounts of the historical origins of the Ottoman pastirma. The armies of settled agricultural peoples had cereal-based diets. Some Turkish and Bulgarian scholars have written that certain medieval fighters who kept dried and salted meat under their saddles had an edge over opponents who ate mostly cereals. Amenius Marcellinius wrote that the Huns warmed this meat by placing it between their uh, legs or on the backs of their horses. Yeah, come on, give me a little more. Anyway, let's continue. So, looking at some of the histories, to thinking about the etymology that baklava, I think we can safely say, comes from Turkey. Now, let's go to Eda to see how we make baklava. Selam, Kenneth. 
Baklavayı gerçekten yiyebileceğim en iyi yerde yemişsin. Hatta oh, fazla so beğenip good. biraz fazla yediğini duydum. Ee, biz de şimdi güzel bir baklava tarifi verelim o zaman. Öncelikle malzemelerden başlıyorum. 1 yumurtam, 3 yemek kaşığı yoğurdum, 1 su bardağı suyum, 2 yemek kaşığı sirkem, 1 çay bardağı sıvı yağım, 1 kabartma tozum, 1 çay kaşığı tuzum, 6 su bardağı unum, yarım kilo fıstığım ve açmak için de buğday nişastam var. O zaman yapmaya başlayalım. Öncelikle yumurtamı kırarak başlıyorum. Yoğurdumu ilave ediyorum. Sıvı yağımı. 2 çorba kaşığı sirke. Kabartma tozumu koyuyorum. 1 çay kaşığı tuz. Suyumu ilave ediyorum. Ve bu aşamada birazcık bu malzemeleri karıştırıyorum. Ben elimle karıştıracağım ama isterseniz kaşık veya çatal kullanabilirsiniz. Yavaş yavaş unumu ilave edeceğim. Bu da birazcık... Hala biraz elime yapışıyor. O yüzden biraz daha ekleyeceğim. Şimdi tezgahı alıyorum. Biraz da burada toplayacağım. Elime yapışmayan ama e, yumuşak bir kıvamda. Böyle keserek bu şekilde bezeler oluşturuyoruz. Şimdi açmaya başlayabilirim. Okay, I'm skipping this. All right, yeah, whatever. She makes it. Um, the video is. I'll tell you one thing. I, I, I don't. I thought the video would be like a little bit more informative. Abi sarma ve dolmayı da savunur musun? Sarmaya dolma des diyorlar, canımı sıkıyorlar. Um, I go back. No, man. I, I mean, it's great that she's making it, but I thought this would be more about like the etymology of the word or blah blah blah. The word yogurt comes from the Turkish uh, word yoğurmak, which means to thicken, coagulate, and curdle. The use of yogurt was by medieval Turks that recorded the books the, in the books Divan Lugat al Turk by Mahmud Kashgari and Kutatku Bilig. Kutatku Bilig! Oh my god! I haven't heard that in a fucking million years. Both written in the 11th century, the text mentioned the word yoğurt and describe its use by nomadic Turks. The Turks were also the first to evaluate yoğurt's medicinal use for a variety of illnesses and symptoms such as diarrhea. And cramps, and to alleviate the discomfort of sunburned skin. We invented it. <laughs> to which Stavros responds, Greek yogurt. It, this is all Levantine. You are colonizers, and Greeks are thieves. This is like Quebecois arguing with Canadians on who is more colonizer. Wait, did you just compare? Wait, what the fuck? Brother. Brother. <laughs> Edit. At a certain point, you got to let go of the nomadic Turks coming from the steppes. You know what I mean? <laughs> At that point, it's like well-established, you know? <laughs> I feel like, I feel like if we're, if we're, <laughs> once a couple centuries have gone by, at that point, you're kind of there, you know, you're, <laughs> you're from the area. <laughs> uh, anyway, now look up Lahmacun and defend it as Turkish again. No, I can't. As much as I want to, I can't defend Lahmacun. Lahmacun as a term in and of itself is like not even Turkic in origin, I don't think. Um, I don't know enough about lamajun, which I love, by the way. Oh, my God, it's so fucking good. And it's beautiful and delicious in Turkey, but I don't think it's uh, it's Turkic or Turkish in origin. Um, yeah, Greek yoğurdun sahibi Türk satış hamlesi için Greek ismen yürümüş. No, I, yeah, the guy, the, the I mean, Trobani is like a Turkish dude, or I think a Kurdish dude. So the reason why he sells it as Greek yogurt is because, you know, it would be easier for Americans to consume it as a, as though it's Greek. If he sold it as Turkish yogurt, obviously it would be, you know, it, it, it would not, people would not like it. <laughs> Sarma means to wrap, rice and grape leaves wrapped around. Dolma means to fill, peppers filled with rice. Argument ended, you're welcome. Yeah. Lahmacun means meat dough in Arabic, so lahmacun is probably of Arabic origin. Yes. No, no, I, I know. I, I can't defend lahmacun as a Turkish uh, food. Lahmacun origin is Armenian and possibly Arabic. I thought it was Arabic. God, I love I love food history. Now tell Chad how the French croissants are Turkish. Is that well? I know. Wait, I, I don't know about that one. French croissants? Did I cover this before? I don't think that's the case. No, they're Viennese. Oh, 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 from uh, Vienna. That's why. Oh, Jesus Christ! It's from the same fucking time frame. Croissants are Viennese and were, uh, were created in celebration of the Habsburgs defeat of the Ottoman Empire at the Battle of Vienna. Oh, God. 1683, worst year of my life. 1453, best year of my life. 1683, worst year of my life. When we got to the fucking gates of Vienna and were purged. Um, that's when the, when the sick man of Europe was, was stopped. Why oh, you got to bring that up? The crescent shape is part of the Ottoman flag. Yeah. 
Um, the the thing is, that's where the crescent cakes come from in in um, in Vienna as well. That's my Roman Empire. Yeah, literally. 1683, best year of Europe. Dude said we. Yeah, I did. I wonder what it would be like if the Ottoman Empire was able to fucking push through and make it all the way to the British Empire. Like, I wonder what... He would still not be in the EU. No, I don't think the EU would have uh, existed in the way that it did. I think that... I mean, no, it it... it, it stretched way too thin at that point there's just no there's just no fucking way if ottomans made it to europe europe wouldn't be as fascist and as backwards and as uncivilized as it is now well a lot of europe would have better food that's for sure there would be such a thing as uh well german cuisine is already turkish but um it would have been more turkish ironically world war one goes differently no hitler for what whatever that's worth in a new timeline true um, no Hitler, no World War II. Uh, the treatment of uh, Jewish people in Europe would be far better if if it stayed under the uh, the uh, Ottoman style of governance. There'd be a lot of issues, though. There's no way. Uh huh. It's joy. Jank is almost here. Dun dun dun. True. Watch Norman Fink. Frank Stain, you fucking did a great job explaining that. Chipotle, money, come here, boy. Come here, Chip. Come here. Good job. Good job. Good boy. Here's a little treat for you. Okay, pay attention with me now, all right? Let's pretend that these four quarters are the equivalent to four ounces of protein at your restaurant. And we want to make sure that you're getting the same amount of money in your piggy bank as we're getting protein in our little bowls. So when you use a spoon like this, Chip, sometimes... It slips out before it even gets in your bowl. So sometimes you get four quarters. Sometimes you get one. And that's not very fair, is it? This is the most Mormon looking dude I've ever seen in my life. What's good? What up? Where's, where's, uh, where's Baba? Where's Uncle Jank? I, I need, we need him. The people are requesting, nay, demanding his presence. It's, it's a, it's a, probably fine. Yeah. Do you like being talked down to like a dog? Chipotle? I don't think so. So why do you treat us like animals every time we come into your restaurant? You've gotten our messages. You've chosen not to respond to them. Using this can make a real big difference, making sure that nothing slips between the cracks. We're fed up. We're barking. Each day that you continue- You run for a president and you forget about your familial obligations? He is. This dude is Mormon for sure. Yeah, he's, he's so Mormon coded. <laughs> Israel mocked online. Is Israel losing the propaganda war? Don Uyghur! Salam! Salam alaikum! It's the cut with the zip-up sweater. Yeah. If he visits president, can we can we still do Janksgiving? Dude, Janksgiving for America if he wins president. Yeah. Next year, the, the Thanksgiving will be at the White House as Murat. Murat, chikarasana. Ishesin, ishesin. Holy, your YouTube is pure brain rot. What the fuck? Yeah, what do you think? I watch all of the YouTube videos that I watch on stream chat. You know what I watch. Why would you expect? Why would you expect my 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 uh, uh, recommended videos to be any different? Um, Marat V Jank, you would mod it. What? What is this? Thank you. Thank you for sending us the Shenzhen driving tour. It really it always calms me down. I'm like a like a baby with autism. You put this in front of me and on my iPad. I'm going to stop screaming. Oh. We're watching uh, Shenzhen driving tour, the prefecture level city with the highest annual GDP in China. This uh -huh. is, it just calms me down when I feel angry at the world. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, my great honor to bring to you um, presidential candidate. Um, that's it. I the Presidential candidate. Uh, anti-crime candidate, uh, Jenk Uger. He's in the building. Uh, first ever naturalized U.S. citizen running for office. Uh, it's the Thanksgiving treat at this point. It's, uh, you know, you have turkey, you watch football, maybe you toss the pigskin around yourself. Mm -hmm. And I and my uncle get together and have a Jenk off. That's right. A real uncle-nephew standoff. That's right. Not true. Ted Cruz ran in 2016. Doesn't matter. Uh, 
they, those were all uh, uh, technically still considered natural born U.S. citizens. Apparently, I did not know this. He does. Actually, yeah, let's get started with that. I told you George Romney was born in Mexico, and therefore, uh, he was not eligible in the same way that you weren't. But you said no. That's actually not the case. George Romney has a uh, had like another like legal way of getting in, and the only person was what Barry Goldwater. Yeah. So um, everybody has an excuse. Uh, John McCain was born in the uh, Panama. It was born in Panama, but he was born on a military base. Ted Cruz claims that his mom was an American citizen, which actually what do you mean claims is not the case. No, because she was voting Canadian elections at the time. So that's actually on the record. So Ted Cruz should have Ooh, never been allowed. To what the fuck? Run. It, it, Ted Cruz is not even a citizen. He never got naturalized. Bro, you're coming in hot right now, though. Yeah. So since he never got naturalized, he's actually not even a citizen. He shouldn't even be a senator, let alone crazy. running for president. Uh, so, uh, but th- th- he claimed that his mom was an a- was a citizen at the time he was born, which would give him the excuse. George Romney's the same way. Barry Goldwater was born in the Arizona Territory uh, and was not a natural born citizen. Uh, and so I don't know what excuse they're using for him, but it's not mm-hmm. in the Constitution. So like people cheat all the time. Uh, so they're like, oh, yeah, Republican, white guy, totally allowed to run. The whole thing got right. amended I gotta, out of the I got to try and fix the microphones. Hold on. Uh, no, this is bad. Hold on. I just, I, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make your, I'm trying to max out your mic, mm-hmm. but it, I'm having a hard time. I, I've already maxed out your- I usually max out my mic. <laughs> no, I know, but it's not working right now for some reason. I don't know what it is. Speak into it again? Yeah. One, two, three. Um, people were saying that you were not loud enough. Yeah. Uh, that, I, you have no noise gate either, so I don't know why. Yeah. Um, uh, it is very unusual for me to not be loud enough. Yeah. I lowered my own volume a little bit so we can match yours, and then right. hopefully uh, hopefully, chat will shut their stupid, stupid mouths. I'm not going to curse because <laughs> the kids are right in the vicinity. All right. Okay. So bottom line is, guys, 14th Amendment says all persons born or naturalized have due process and equal protection. Okay. So... It already got amended out of the Constitution. So anyone out there who's like, uh, oh, did you read the Constitution, man? Yeah, I read it. it, it uh, we, no. Oh you, oh, you know what? I hadn't read it until a troll on Twitter told me. And oh, oh, there it is. Oh, why? Wow, I should have checked, right? No. Did you read the kind of part? Do you understand what it means to amend something, amend the Constitution? And it says very clearly. Born or naturalized, okay. equal protection. It's okay, super but, clear. But uh, have you considered the fact that I'm racist? Ah, uh, another one I hadn't thought of. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, there is actually a movement online uh, called Don't Care, Still Voting for Jank. That's right. I don't know if you were aware of this or I not. I actually am not. How do you get rid of Hamas? Let's take a look. If you don't do it the way Israel is currently doing it, albeit with... You do what America did with the Osama bin Laden. We didn't go drop a nuke on Pakistan. We didn't go d- destroy 6,000 residential buildings in the middle of Pakistan. We sent in special forces. Is it more dangerous to the special forces? Of course. That's the point of special forces. Try to find the hostages. Does it look like Israel's trying to find the hostages? If I have a family member that's a hostage, I'm disgusted what, by what Netanyahu's doing now. How do you know they're not in the buildings you're dropping bombs on? How do you know they're not in the tunnels you're dropping bombs on? How do you know they're not in the hospitals you're dropping bombs on? So this, if you want the hostages rescued, every rational human being can agree. This is not the way to do it. This is the way to do death and destruction for the sake of death and destruction. It's collective punishment. It's genocide against Palestinians. And the world has to speak out. So my way is not pleasant either. It involves a lot of folks dying on, uh, on both sides. I understand that. Those are super hard choices. But go find Hamas. Go find the hostages. Go rescue them instead of wantingly, indiscriminately, killing after killing. And let's be honest, when you drop a bomb and, and, a, and a kid's head explodes and a grandmother is incinerated, that is terrorism. Yeah, don't care. Still voting Yo. for drink. That video that we just watched. Yeah. Wait, what the fuck happened? Uh, that video we had has 370,000 likes on TikTok. Yeah, it, that segment got over 4 million views on YouTube. Yeah, you it's, you killed it. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you and I have, uh, I guess, some disagreements on that. Uh, I, I think, like, the, the best way to negotiate 
or the best way to deal with the situation is to negotiate and do the exact opposite. That was my perspective after 9-11 as well. Uh, people have uh, often asked me, you know, what should have America done? And I'm like, literally the opposite of what they did, which I think you would agree with as well. Do you think America should have invaded Afghanistan after 9-11? Well, that's a complicated one. Iraq, obviously not. Uh, so for Afghanistan, it depends on what version of the story you believe. Uh, did they actually offer up bin Laden or didn't they? If they were offered up bin Laden, then it's a no-brainer. You take bin Laden, you don't invade Afghanistan for no reason. Well, they offered up bin Laden before, as a matter of fact, before 9-11. 9-10 specifically was when, um, what's the guy that... The guy that got assassinated, uh, it was... Uh, Rashid Dostum? No, 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 no. Gülbüdin Hekmatyar? No, 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 no. Not None of those guys. And also, Dostum is still alive, isn't he? What the yeah, fuck? Probably, yeah. Yeah, what are you talking about? Dostum is I don't like... Know, I accidentally killed Dostum. Never. Yeah. <laughs> Ahmed Ahmed Shah Massoud was the was the, the uh, leader of the Northern Allegiance, right? And he uh, famously... Uh, before his assassination as an Afghan politician and military commander, he was, uh, you know, one of the... One of the Mujahideen that uh, was, was obviously another rugged anti-Soviet fighter, but uh, obviously the Mujahideen were a collection of different, um, uh, different forces that were not aligned with one another ideologically. There was like different sects, uh, different opinions. Um, he was uh, following the rise of the Taliban in 1996. Masood was a, a rejectioner of the Taliban's fundamentalist interpretation of Islam, and he was a leader of the Northern Alliance, and he uh, wanted. He told America that he uh, wanted to give up Osama bin Laden, and then he was executed um, because yeah. the CIA leaked his uh, location uh, in uh, still disputed claims on whether or not it was deliberately done. Who knows? But the CIA leaked his location, and then he was uh, he was assassinated by uh, he was assassinated by uh, uh, Al Qaeda that found his uh, information and and portrayed themselves as. Uh, portray themselves as journalists, actually, in a TV interview, and then they blew him up. Um, yeah. yeah, that was great. So the other time that we had Bin Laden uh, where we could have at least withdrawn at that point is that we had him cornered in Tora Bora shortly after we went in. And there's a New York Times article about how uh, Rumsfeld said, no, do not pursue him. Yeah, we isn't had, that where the we don't negotiate with terrorists come from as well? Um, no, that, not from that one because there was no negotiation. We had him cornered. And the American general asked permission to pursue. And Rumsfeld said, no, do not pursue. And so we just oh, let I was talking about this. Go. I was talking about this. On October 14th, uh, Sunday, October 14th, 2001, um, an article older than half of chat uh, in The Guardian writes, Bush rejects Taliban offer to hand bin Laden over. The reason why they said they were uh, denying this offer was because the Taliban said, we will, uh, we will give you Osama bin Laden. As long as you, uh, you know, take it to the International Criminal Court and as long as there's evidence as to his wrongdoing, which you could look at and interpret as like, oh, well, that's bullshit. You know, that's that's bullshit. But I could look at that and say that's perfect. Uh, yeah. What did we do with the Nazis? We brought them to Nuremberg. We didn't just summarily execute them. We did uh, rule of law. And did we have evidence on bin Laden? Yeah, of course we had evidence on bin Laden. So I don't. So that's three times we rejected an offer to get bin Laden because we wanted more war. And so I don't agree with that. But if, uh, you know, if there was no real offer, then we would have had to go and get bin Laden. But again, the good news is right after we went in, we had him. And Rumsfeld and Cheney turned it down. wonder why. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, the website's jenkforamerica.com. And, uh, and the thing is, for that, the movement that's saying, I don't care, I'm still voting for Jenk. First of all, I love you. Thank you. Appreciate you. But second of all, you don't have to worry about it. We're going to go to court. And the court's either going to say yes or no. So it shouldn't affect whether you're going to vote for me. The judge is going to be like, don't care, voting for Jank. That's what the judge is going to say. Well, that's entirely possible. Or they could say, yeah, I care, and you're right. <laughs> the 14th Amendment clearly amended it. So anyway, this is the, this is the Bin Laden stuff that we were talking about. But like uh, the parallel here is, of course, in my opinion, uh, with October 7, I think that um, I think what you said on Piers is, is, I mean, it's decent. It's definitely far better than like 99% of democratic politicians at that moment, almost 99% of democratic politicians. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that you and I are in agreement on this issue. I don't, I don't think we're going to fight a lot on this on, we're not going to have a jank off on Israel, Palestine. It seems. No, I mean, look, I, I don't like, I, 
I think Hamas is counterproductive. I think they're Muslim fundamentalists. I got no interest in them. I don't know if you uh, disagree with that. Uh, but obviously the Palestinians should be free. Uh, obviously the occupation is an unbearable injustice. And obviously we shouldn't send a, a dime to Israel uh, until they not only end this bombing campaign, but end the occupation. So I don't know why in the world we would support someone who is oppressing people for 56 straight years. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I think that's a, a fairly reasonable take. I, the only difference, I guess, is that like, um, no, I mean, I agree with all of that. Yeah. It's not like, uh, I've talked about this before. It's not like Hamas it, in and of itself is like a, like a popular movement. It's more so um, anyone who will uh, retaliate against Israel's unjustifiable criminal occupation, its belligerent occupation. Um, I think that is like, that is what the, the uh, broad majority opinion of the Palestinians is that like, uh, the understanding is the occupation has to be costly. Because if it's not, then Israel uh, thinks they can just continue getting away with what they're doing. And, you know. So I'll just say two things about that. One, uh, when the Palestinians went to the UN to try to get a state declared, just like Israel did, when Israel said that that was unacceptable and America backed that play, uh, that's what led to this. Because yeah. you, if you say diplomacy is terrorism and terrorism is terrorism, well, then you're going to get actual terrorism because you're not giving any political diplomatic peaceful solution a chance it was absurd and it was unconscionable for america yeah. to not support the palestinians uh, resolution to get a state through the United well there Nations. was also the 27 hamas heel turn basically where they they uh did the same thing they tried to do a plo situation where uh they updated their charter uh and then they said like they wanted to gain international recognition but of course, that was uh, completely a a antithetical to what uh, the Israeli governments were designing Hamas to be, a fundamentalist terror cell. They're bad. They're terrorists. Everyone in Palestine are terrorists. They voted for Hamas. I mean, this is something that... So I, can I just, uh, just right. say two things about that? First of all, I've now seen a bunch of uh, Israeli officials, including Isaac Herzog, the president, say that. And what they're doing is they're agreeing with Hamas. And they're agreeing with Osama bin Laden. Uh, in bin Laden's letter to the U.S., he said uh, the American civilians had it coming because they voted for the American uh, administrations that they have, like the Bush one. Uh, and Hamas says the Israeli uh, citizens had it coming because they voted for Netanyahu, etc. So when uh, Isaac Herzog says, well, the Palestinians once voted for Hamas, you know, 20 years ago, so their civilians had it coming, that is li a very literal terrorist uh, talking point. So yeah, but you he's don't, advocating for terrorism. Okay, you don't understand. Um, have you considered that terrorism can only be done by what we perceive our enemy combatants? I wouldn't say brown guys in the situation because Israel is very brown in the exact same way that, like, Palestine is. You know what I mean? But, yeah. like, in the eyes of the American, uh, in the eyes of the Western world, we mostly only see Ashkenazi Jews. So we think, like, oh, those are the white guys on the field. Yeah, no, it's those, like... That's why all these labels are so stupid. Like, the Israelis and the Palestinians are nearly indistinguishable. They're, they're, of course, we're the same people. We're all indistinguishable. We're, our DNA is like 99.9% .9 the same. It's just labels that we put on people, Israeli, Palestinian, Jewish, Muslim. It's silly. It's totally, it, to kill each other over that is insanity. And, okay, and then one last thing. It's not, it's not a religious conflict, necessarily. I think it's more so that... That is the justification used to harden, um, further polarize and harden the battle lines, basically. Like, to be able to draw the battle lines accurately, or, or um, what the fuck? What is happening here? This is, like, in the way. Hold on, I'm trying to move this. Okay, there it is. To, to, uh, to justify it, to sell the war. Yeah, well, there's, there's a bunch of factors. So, the religious fundamentalism of the Israeli settlers is definitely relevant. Of Hamas is definitely relevant. Uh, and the, uh, it helps to separate out them in a way that is unresolvable. In other words, it's disastrous because it separates them out in a way that's unresolvable. But ultimately, it's a power dynamic at play. And so the the and and by the way, they say, oh well, if Hamas had the power that Israel has, they'd they'd uh, kill every Jew. No, that's actually not at all true. It would play out almost exactly as it's playing out now, where the Palestinians would oppress the Israelis and occupy them. But you don't but even they wouldn't kill all of them. That's ridiculous. But you don't even know that because, um, like, we we have no way of knowing that because Hamas and any kind of political mobilization that it's been able to 
uh, create for itself, any kind of like popularity that it's been able to cultivate for itself. And it's been deeply unpopular throughout its inception and, and well into the 2000s. And even now is not uh, a, a very popular entity is due to the occupation, uh, is due to the fact that uh, time and time again, these negotiations that were being done with Yasser Arafat uh, led to more settlements, more expansion of the West Bank, more oppression, the, the permit tyranny that uh, Palestinians were subjected to. Um, so I don't even think that Hamas, in the way that we understand it, or the way that it exists, would exist if they had uh, if they had that same level of power. No, no, 100%. Except yeah. for the fact that the... Whichever government has unlimited power will almost always abuse it, right? And that's what's happening in Israel. But overall, of course, Hamas wouldn't exist if there was no occupation. Yeah, and they would vanish. It would, yeah, yeah. And and I so look. Uh, one other defense that uh, Israeli supporters use is, well, all these guys are anti-Semitic, so they, they no matter what we do, they try to kill us. That's nonsense, total utter nonsense. Yeah. So first of all, there's global anti-Semitism that is definitely true, right? But is that related to why the Palestinians in particular are aggrieved with Israel? <laughs> yeah. No, it's because you're occupying them. That's not complicated. <laughs> Pretending it's because they're hateful. Okay, when were they supposed to love you? At what point in the occupation where the Palestinians go, hey, you know what? Even though these guys have been occupying us and taking away all of our dignity, our economic opportunity, dropping bombs on us, cutting off the water and power anytime they want, and bringing in settlers to steal our land and having them execute us every once in a while summarily, we're supposed... Oh, right, but we love them. But we love I, them. I think I would go so far as to say that I think Palestinians do show a tremendous amount of resilience and also are infinitely less hateful towards uh, Jewish people or even even Israelis in general, but like Jewish people in, uh, across the board, than one would expect under any other normal circumstance. Something that Norm Finkelstein talks about a lot is like the hatred that his parents, his mom and dad, both Holocaust survivors, both concentration camp survivors, they were in the Warsaw Ghetto, the hatred that they experience, the hatred that they feel towards Germans carried on to like their experiences living in America and that, and he always talks about like how understandable of a hatred that was, considering like what the Germans had done, um, what the Nazis had done, and that distinction is is uh, almost impossible to make, even after uh, years and years of of like surviving uh, that oppression. As far as I've seen, uh, Palestinians are infinitely less hateful. Maybe it's because they understand their position is like uh, born into oppression. And they they are very cognizant, or maybe it's because they are uh, hyper educated, uh, in spite of all of the circumstances that they've been uh, that they've had to deal with. But you know, most Palestinians that I I uh, uh, I hear from are are uh, way less hateful than they normally uh, it, anyone else would in under normal circumstances. Yeah, last thing I'll say on that is, look, they they set up this uh, oppression loop that is unbreakable. So they say. Since they hate us, we have to occupy and oppress them. And the more they occupy and oppress them, the more they, they are hated, of course, as would happen in any situation, right? So then they say, well, now you hate us more. Now we have to occupy you more. Oh, yeah. well, now you hate us more. Now we have to occupy you more. So it's an infinite loop that cannot be broken. And the reason for that is that it's not that Netanyahu and the Israeli right-wing government couldn't figure that out logically. It said they want to occupy. Yeah. Them. No, they that, want to exactly. take more land. Exactly. I mean, this is, I think this is one of the most prescient uh, uh, Netanyahu takes of all time. This is like, uh, it was on uh, TRT, Terete, uh, the Turkish uh, broadcaster. Let me see if I can find it. But um, do you guys, do you guys know the uh, video I'm talking about? It's like the old one from like 2001. Oh, here it is. A leaked uh, video from 2001. It's not even a leaked video, but. Oh, yeah, yeah. This so, this, so yeah. perfectly summarizes like exactly what his position is and exactly how he deals with like American leaders in general. A leak video of 2001 shows Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu talking about how you, Israel inter, intentionally strikes Palestinians painfully, how he deceived the U.S. to break the Oslo Accords, and how Americans will always support Israel if it faces backlash. <laughs> Uh, 
<laughs> the world will uh, say that we're the aggressive. Hold on. Because they can say whatever they want. Aren't you afraid of what they'll say, Bibi? Especially today with the U.S.? I know how they are. America is something that you can easily maneuver and move in the right direction. And even if they say something, so then they say something. So what? 80% of Americans support us. By the way, this is the same Benjamin Netanyahu who sidestepped Barack Obama, regularly uh, undermined him, went to the Republican Congress and delivered a speech while Obama was president. And he's right. You know what Obama did on his fucking way out? By the way, Obama, least popular politician in Israel, uh, widely condemned by by uh, Zionists as like a like a Jew hater directly. That's that's like what you know uh, the the uh, what ultra Zionists have said about Barack Obama. What did Obama do on his way out after being undermined and and uh, shit all over by Benjamin Netanyahu? Oh, he gave him thirty eight billion dollars over the course of the next ten years. So you know he's right. Netanyahu is right. <laughs> What happened with the Oslo Accords? The Accords which were ratified by Parliament. I was asked before the 1996 elections, will you fulfill them? Yeah. I said yes, subject to reciprocity and minimizing pullouts. I gave my own interpretation of the agreements in such a way that will allow me to stop the race back towards the 1967 borders. How do we manage to do this? Nobody defined what military facilities are. So they kept on taking more land under the auspices of military uh, use. So I define them as being security zones. He's saying that. The entire Jordan Valley for me is a military facility. Nobody has, yes, like the Beit Sheon Valley. You see, go figure. It's so funny that this is like presented as like leaked video, but the hilarity of it is that there is nothing leaked about this. This is all well documented. Half of the shit that he's saying here is half of the shit he ran on time and time again. And also the other half is like very well documented by Israeli human rights organizations like Betselem. So none of this is like a big secret. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, no one, it, it doesn't matter at this point. All that there is on the Israeli side is the Israeli right wing. The Israeli left wing doesn't even support them. Uh, and uh, well, the and, Israeli left wing the, is... Yeah, well, it's okay. And then the, <laughs> and the U.S. government, right? Both uh, 95% of Republicans and Democrats. Uh, but not the U.S. people anymore. They've lost us. Uh, so now, you know, he's saying it's so easy to maneuver the Americans. By the way, American citizens, why don't you do an uprising against your own government, right? Look at them. He says... These are all my bitches. I can move them around any way I like. Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter. They kneel at my feet. That's a foreign government's leader saying that. Are you going to sit there and take it? Are you going to keep electing people like Biden and, and, yes, Trump, who are their bitches and who do everything that Netanyahu tells them to do? Like a dog, Trump heals to this guy. Biden, of course, heals to this guy. He's been healing to him for 50 straight years. President Jenk. Yeah, jankforamerica.com. I'm actually for America, not like these guys who sell us out to foreign countries nonstop. Has Trump stopped taking Saudi money yet? Is Biden off his knees yet for Saudi Arabia? Again, Saudi Arabia bitch slaps Biden and raises gas prices right before the midterms, so, uh, you know, insults him to his face. And what does Biden do? T nothing, nothing. He just kneels again. So I'm tired of the, these so-called Democratic leaders who, who kneel to everybody, kneel to all their corporate donors, kneel to our foreign governments, doesn't matter if it's Israel, Saudi Arabia, they never do what we want. 68% of Americans want a ceasefire, oh, but only like 10% of Congress does because yeah. they don't represent us. They just represent their donors. Anyone telling you otherwise I don't, I don't know what you're is talking a total about. goddamn liar, and everybody knows it except the uh, corrupt in Washington. The, Richie Torres is my congressman, my Richie favorite. Richie Torres, what a sellout. I mean, what a pathetic, pathetic, grovel, groveling sellout. He's, I don't, Dude, I don't know what you're talking about. It. You get money from that lobby. We get it, okay? We all know it. You've groveled enough. Pick yourself up off the ground. It's humiliating. It's embarrassing. <laughs> Richie Torres, Jesus Christ, man. Have some dignity. Their boots are clean already, Richie. 
Get up off the ground. And when you talk about lobbies, I talk about defense contractors, oil companies. They also benefit from conflicts in the Middle East. But if you don't think that APEC is a lobby that affects the Democratic and Republican parties, Dude, you're I, on crack. No, no I've one never, doesn't think that. I have never seen someone like someone so openly and flagrantly uh, defend uh, a, a group that they're so directly getting financial support from. Like... This would be akin to a politician literally being like, if you consider Raytheon to be like an evil company, then I will, I think you should be arrested. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, you're a terrorist if you don't yeah, support Raytheon. Yeah, you're a terrorist if you don't support Raytheon. more of our money. Like right? most, most senators and most congressmen at least like have the dignity of like shutting the fuck up when they know they should. Richie Torres is like so horny that he literally shat on the president of J Street. Did you see this? But J Street is also a Zionist institution. It's just supposed to be a liberal Zionist institution that's like, you know, anti-settlements and things of that nature. And like, they're supposed to be a counterbalance to APAC. I like J Street. Yeah. I don't, you know, I I have friends that have worked at J Street that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, my point is, J Street's perspective, well, early on, after October 7th, was, was also insane, which... Uh, a lot of the people that used to work with J Street and still work within J Street were like, dial it back. What the fuck are you guys doing? Remember when they did the no ceasefire bill? Uh, so I, I don't. But look, here's the thing communicate, about J Street. Anyway, they're, the bottom line is they're certainly not anybody's radical, right? They're no, just they're not. A, like in, they're comparison, in comparison to APAC, is, of course they're not. So, yeah. yeah, they're liberal Zionists in general. But here's the point I'm trying to make. Richie Torres yelled at the president of J Street after Jamal Bowman talked about a J Street-backed uh, West Bank trip that the uh that american congress uh, men and women took okay where he said he was not uh allowed into certain uh parts of the west bank because he wasn't jewish and richie torres was like that's a lie and then he conflated that with an actual anti-semitic conspiracy the jewish space lasers conspiracy uh and said west bank checkpoints are a lie akin to the jewish space lasers like jewish checkpoints in the west bank yeah which is fucking psychotic. Like you're, it, it's it's like the most insane thing you can say. You're you're undermining the severity of anti-Semitism by conflating it with things that are demonstrably correct that people have seen and documented. Israeli human rights groups have documented this for years and years. It's so fucking stupid. Haas, I actually saw that in your in one of your tweets, yeah. and I couldn't believe he said that. So. There's real anti-Semitism in the world and in the country right now. I mean, two synagogues got shot up. Yeah. Right wingers are, uh, you know, now you know they're supporting Nick Fuentes. Donald Trump had dinner with Fuentes, Kanye West. They're openly talking Elon about Elon some- Musk is talking about fucking Jewish uh, great replacement conspiracy. Yeah, that's totally nuts, right? Like in the moment of this like heightened anti-Semitism, for them to use it for political reasons is disgusting. It's it's the boy who cried wolf at the worst possible time. To say that uh, Jewish space lasers, which is an obviously anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, is yeah. the equivalent of saying that there's checkpoints in the West Bank. What are you talking about? Of course there's checkpoints in the West Bank. Netanyahu would agree that there's checkpoints in the West Bank. Yeah. That's a mental thing to say. That's saying, hey, listen, I will do any lie. I will do any piece of propaganda. Please send checks to richiedoras.com or wherever the hell you, your website is. Dude, we see you, brother. We see you. The whole world sees how pathetic you are, Richie Torres. Yeah, You're I, like a groveling, groveling, pathetic, miserable person. It, Just it's, go into some other job. Become a plumber. Become a dentist. Do something useful with your life instead of being a, a, a floor mat, a, 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 the dirty mop that you use, like the dirtiest mop you have. For any lobbyist that comes by, it well, he deleted have it. to be APAC. To be, de- to be fair, he deleted it. Except he blocked me, and he's been, like, going off on a fucking tangent still. Uh, uh, you know, he, he's just, he's a ridiculous person, debasing himself in this way. Uh, also, once again, uh, another person is John Fetterman as well, which is so, so fucking, disappointing. so disappointing. You so want me to s- tell you the backstory of that? Because I, I was... All right, give us the, give us the deets. Yeah, so... When Fetterman was running, he's running as a populist progressive. We're all super excited. This is pre-stroke, right? And uh, <laughs> and so I'm just keeping it real, right? And at that point, he's like the next coming. Like, well, I think he's going to run for president. He's got yeah. the best chance of winning. He can knock Biden out. I'm super jazzed about Fetterman, right? And he gets it that you shouldn't do the robotic 
plastic crap that other politicians do. Yeah. Then he's never he's a lieutenant governor, so he's never spoken out about Israel. So everybody's curious how is he going to handle it? Because right at that point, Democratic majority for Israel, APAC, etc., are dumping millions of dollars into races. They've yeah. already spent four million dollars against Nina Turner. So everybody knows that. So they're we're all the progressive community is waiting to see what he's going to say. Is he going to a stand up to them, b punt, or c kiss their ass? And he comes out with an aggressively ass-kissing message. And so at that point, I, I no hate. Okay, I got it. You're trying to win the election. You don't want $4 million spent against you. But once you win the election, then you're an incumbent. You have a ton of money. You have a ton of money. Do you see what I'm showing you, though? Power and leverage, okay? Do you see what I'm showing you? Democratic majority for Israel PAC endorses Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman for Senate. Of course. You kiss their ass, they endorse you. That's how it works. But then he gets into Senate. And it turns out he's like Richie Torres Jr. And he's, you know, that's a heavy insult. I, I'll take it back, right? But it's no, like... No, no, I think that's close, valid. Brother. No, 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 it's valid. He has more to offer than Richie Torres for sure. But I think that it's an incredibly valid comparison to make because he quite literally, I don't know why, is, is seemingly dropped everything else and like either talks about being depressed wearing fucking uh, his, his dumbass outfits or Israel and defending Israel unconditionally. He had a fucking Israeli flag that he was waving at the pla Palestinian, uh, the, the Palestinian protesters outside of a demonstration. Yeah. He went to the fucking psychotic let's kill more babies march that they did uh, where, where John Hagee, uh, famous anti-Semitic, psychopathic, far-right evangelical, uh, uh, evangelical televangelist was speaking about how, you know, Israel has a right to Judea and Samaria because it's like, you know, Armageddon is going to happen. If you say, by the way, that Israel has a right to Judea and Samaria, it's the same thing as saying river to the sea. It's, it's pro genocide. No, it's, genocide. Way, it's way past river to the sea yeah. because river to the sea in its inception and consistently has been an emancipatory slogan that does not mean killing Jews. Like, I am not, I don't know if you're an anti-river to the sea guy I'm not. I don't want it. Like it's it's not a useful thing. So I, I've defended it unconditionally I, I, I and continue you. to and defend it. I understand it. that it could be interpreted in, in different ways, and I've said that. Having said that, it's not a helpful or productive thing to say. But if you say that Israel should have Judea and Samaria, one, you're a religious fundamentalist nut job. You're a lunatic who should be locked up in an asylum. Uh, number two, uh, you you're basically saying you're pro genocide uh, and and have no respect for the Palestinian people. Uh, you're against all also, I don't, I don't think, law. You're for war crimes. Here's why I don't think it's an equivalence either, by the way, because it is in the part of the Likud cha uh, Charter as well. Um, the equivalence does not exist there because, like, from the river to the sea, Palestinians are under occupation. And the occupying force saying that is, of course, going to be a little bit different. It's the same dynamic between black power, which is an emancipatory slogan, an emancipatory group, versus white power, which came after black power in an effort to, uh, to, to do white identitarian politics which was inherently uh, genocidal and, and fascist. There's no need for it. That's all. My, we, we're 100% right on this issue. Yeah. That's and, all. So anyway, um, I, I just, uh, I, the reason why I defend it unconditionally is because, well, one, I care about the etymology, I care about the history of the statement, but also because people get fucking fired over it. And I think that's ridiculous. Susan Sarandon just uh, got dropped by UTA very cowardly. Uh, she, fucking the, the, the head of CAA's like motion pictures division yeah. is, as far as I understand, like the one of the only like Libyan women of color in a position of power in fucking Hollywood, and she was slated to be dropped entirely from CAA, and then Tom Cruise stepped up and was like, "No, you can't do that. This is my agent. I want her to stay." And and a bunch of like the powerful clients of CAA had to stand for her so that she didn't lose her job entirely. It is so fucking scummy, so nasty, so fucked up that this is what's happening. You have Melissa Barrera, who, who was dropped from Scream 7 for literally, it, it's like comical, for putting forth uh, uh, on her social media profile, on her Instagram story, a Jewish Currents magazine article from... Holocaust and genocide historian scholar Ross Segal's article on Jewish Currents magazine on how Israel is a textbook case for genocide. This man is a genocide scholar. He's Israeli, he's Jewish, he's writing for Jewish Currents magazine and posting that, that article 
in the eyes of Spyglass Studios or whatever the fuck, uh, was was too far. It was a bridge too far. Yeah. So uh, number one, it's let's uh, be called what it is: cancel culture. So now it's McCarthyism. Yeah. It's the only real type of cancel culture that like has been so uh, uh, systematized in the United States of America. Historically speaking, cancel culture has never there has never been like a like a anti uh, uh, Nazi cancel culture in America. Nazis have been historically defended under the auspices of free speech. The only time where we have historically allowed Congress and allowed politicians and allowed organizations to undermine political action uh, that is supposed to be protected under the First Amendment is McCarthyism, Red Scare. Yeah, <laughs> and Barry Weiss started can cancel culture by oh, going yeah. around targeting Palestinian professors. Oh, yeah. Saying, how dare you treat Palestinians as human beings? You should be fired, right? Yeah. And then they, she pretended to be aggrieved by cancel culture. No, bitch, you started it. Let's be honest about it. Let's call it what it is, okay? And so this is like the height of cancel culture. How dare you disagree with Israel? You're fired. And, it's not, and none of them, by the way, said from River to the Sea at all. They, they said war crimes and genocide. Those are the trigger words, apparently. But those are just facts. Srebrenica, 6,000 Muslims killed. That was called a genocide because they targeted them for being Muslim, right? And so it doesn't, it's, not, it's not Holocaust. It's not the same thing. You're just targeting based on ethnicity and killing a certain number of people and, and mass uh, relocation. There's no question. It's definitional. But it's yeah. such a... There's one hero in that, in that CIA agent story... But it's such a Tom bad... Cruise? Well, uh, along with Tom Cruise, because you already said Tom. But it's such a bad precedent to set and such a bad look. Like, if you're Steven Spielberg, who apparently, if you believe the reporting, I don't know that it's, you know, I'm, I didn't, I wasn't there. But, or any of these other guys who pressured CAA to fire her, that's such a bad look, guys. Wait, Steven At Spielberg At a time of anti-Semitism, you don't go around going, she dared to speak out against Israel. Fire her! No, Spielberg... Right? Wait, I don't, I don't, it says Andy. I, I read it in one of the articles. I'm not putting it on Spielberg. Like, there was a whole bunch of people internally at CAA and externally, their clients, and, and he was mentioned in one of the articles. He's not the pivotal guy. It's not, his name's not important. The point is, a whole bunch of people said, let's fire her because she's there to say a political statement we don't agree with. Yeah. Even though it's technically and factually true, right? The other hero, other than Tom Cruise, was J.J. Uh, Abrams. So he st apparently stepped up behind the scenes. Was like, "What are you guys doing? No, no, don't fire her." And so you know, it was really interesting. Job. Thank you, JJ Abrams. You know who actually? I don't know where they stand now, but you know who actually has been like incredibly critical of the Benjamin Netanyahu administration. Um, and it's not it's it's someone you would not expect. It's someone whose brother you've called yeah, yeah, a yeah. donkey, and yeah. and yeah. is the reason why you were <laughs> maybe we may or may not have left WME as a matter of fact. But yeah, oh, Ari Emanuel. Emanuel. Yeah. Yeah, Ari Emanuel has been like, because I, I looked into it to see like, I wonder what his perspective is because like, obviously Rom is like, fucking reactionary piece of shit, right? Well, so I thought two different things though. So uh, and Rom served in the IDF too. So uh, Ari uh, Emanuel supports Israel two hundred percent, and I'm sure there's a million things we disagree on. Uh, but that's the great thing about Jewish culture is that it not only like allows for dissent, but it advocates dissent it, it wants you it wants to have these you're supposed to challenge the rabbi etc so there's tons and tons of both israelis and jewish americans who can't stand netanyahu and who want to get rid of netanyahu yeah so and ari Emanuel's in that camp and bless his heart for that and he's like how much more do we have to deal with this shit right he's totally incompetent totally self-obsessed totally corrupt let's get rid of this son of a bitch yeah uh, it was uh, Maha Dakil, is who we're talking about, by the way, who worked with big-name celebrities, including Tom's, uh, Tom Cruise, Reese Witherspoon, Natalie Portman, Abby DuVernay, and Hathaway stepped down from the internal board of the Creative Artists Agency following backlash for her incendiary posts. What were the incendiary posts, I wonder? Uh, usually it's like, look, it's not a secret. I've been saying this since October 7th. You have to be very careful when you uh, criticize Israel. It's just the truth. You have to be. For two reasons: one, because you do not want to, you do not want to say anything that can be misconstrued as anti-Semitic, because anti-Semitism is is bigoted, is hateful, it's unacceptable. The other reason is because there are certainly going to be people that want to misconstrue your message to say, "Oh yeah, look at it, he's being anti-Semitic," and when that happens, uh, when you are when your words are cynically misconstrued. 
if you are especially uh, approaching uh, a criticism of Israel from a callous perspective, because you know that, let's say, morality is on your side, um, and you say something as callous as like, maybe not even as callous, but like marginally, 10% as callous as like Amy Schumer, for example, who's been like baying uh, and, and cackling like a fucking hyena about how... Uh, all Palestinians are fucking rapists and deserve death and destruction. Or Sarah Silverman, who literally said, justified uh, uh, that we must cut the electricity and food and water to the Gaza Strip only to be rewarded with a daily show, uh, a broadcasting opportunity. Or Brett Gelman. Uh, all of these guys who were just like saying disgusting, freakish things about uh, uh, about Palestinians and, and how they have to be ethnically cleansed, they will never get punished. You, on the other hand, if you say something that can even be remotely misconstrued, will absolutely get punished. Sometimes by onlookers who don't realize what you're trying to say, and uh, in other instances by the likes of ADL, which, in my opinion, have openly shown that they do not care about real anti-Semitism. They simply care about anti-Zionism. Uh, I think that uh, Jonathan Greenblatt's actions demonstrate this reality. The the actions that are, have been very that have been criticized by a lot of liberal Zionists as well. Um, I, I I didn't know that Sarah Silverman said that. That's disappointing. I really like her. I, I I'm hoping that she realizes it was a mistake. I'll look it up later. And uh, well, but, she said but, that she was uh, high. Okay. Well, she got least, high no, when but she that's said. Okay. At least she's like saying my bad. Um, so for Jonathan Greenblatt, look, he did great work, uh, during the Trump Muslim ban and all that stuff. And so, he, you know, he's a mixed bag. He's done Who? Good, Greenblatt. Yeah. In, in sticking out for Muslims, uh, uh, Americans and other people. But whenever it comes to Israel, he thinks that it's his job to defend Israel. And it isn't, you're missing, you're misconstruing your job, brother. That's APAC and democratic majority for Israel, et cetera. You're supposed to be standing up for Jewish Americans. And so it, the way that, that you, he throws around the word anti-Semitism in regards to defending any Israeli policy is deeply counterproductive. No, they fully, they fully went back to like 1990, uh, early 90s ADL, collaborating yeah. with fucking apartheid South African uh, agents and shit and spying on the Jewish left. Uh, they, it, it's basically back to that level of ADL uh, this time around. Yeah, and you're ruining the credibility of the organization. No, no, it's gone. It's just fucking lit on fire. And and I think Jonathan Greenblatt openly recognized it. Even the former president of ADL literally tweeted out, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt is a piece of shit, basically. Like, I mean, he didn't and say those words. that was because, uh, like, of what he's doing to defend Elon Musk. Yes. Too. And so that's, like, you know what? I mean, I don't even want to bring him up, but, uh, but it's a perfect analogy. Rabbi Shmuley. Right, so oh, he, he goes and attacks me in like the in an insane lunatic way on Piers Morgan, calls me every name of the book, but then it turns out he was the guy defending uh, Bobby Kennedy for saying that uh, coronavirus is uh, genetically designed to avoid Ashkenazi Jews, and he defended Michael Jackson when he wrote "Beat Me, Jew Me" in a song. So he's like a little paid bitch there's to one defend more. There's one more. All right, hold on. Well, not anti-Semites in this case, but he's also defended my favorite uh, defender of Israel slash defender of the constitutional reason is as to why we should look into lowering the age of consent laws, the Dersh. Did you know that? Uh-huh. He, de he defended right. Alan Dershowitz when, uh, when Virginia Jeffrey came out and said, Alan Dershowitz, uh, you know, sexually assaulted me. Uh, friend to Jeffrey Epstein, Alan Dershowitz, he defended of course he did, right? Because he doesn't have it. What does he have? A congregation somewhere? Rabbi, right? He's like a. He has this uh, uh, nonprofit where most of the money goes to him and his wife and their house, I think. Uh, so you can look it up. You can see the exact details, right? Uh, you don't take my word for it. You, my opinion is that Rabbi Shmuley is a corrupt uh, a, a defender of anti Semites and does it for money and is one of the worst pieces of shit there is in media. But you can look it up. That's just my opinion. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so this decision from the CIA was made uh, after Duck Hill uh, reposted an Instagram story on Wednesday, which read in part, you're currently learning who supports genocide. She added her own message over the repost stating, that's the line for me. That's it. What's more heartbreaking than witnessing genocide? Witnessing the denial that the genocide is happening. That's why the, the, the fucking CIA guys were like, that's a bridge too far, actually, madam. Yeah. Yeah. Can't wait. Can't wait to make sick-ass fucking movies 10 years down the line about how, you know, there were brave, 
defenders of, of the Palestinians or whatever the fuck. Like, think about it this way. What are, like, some of the top movies right now? Martin Scorsese's uh, 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 historical rendition of, of uh, uh, Killers of the Flower... Uh, moon? Killers of the Flower Moon. Like, what are we doing? What the fuck are we doing here? Like, y- you guys don't realize? You can't draw a fucking parallel to, to what's happening? I guess they just, like, want... Uh, it, those in Hollywood just, like, don't really give a shit about ethnic cleansing happening because it turns out it makes really good movies. Oppenheimer is another one. Exactly. I, and by the way, they're, I mean, uh, look, let's be honest, okay? They're doing the same exact thing that Turks do, okay? Oh, with the Armenian genocide. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Like, oh, well, no, it's not, it's not a genocide. I mean, I mean, yeah, we marched them, and, yeah, we moved a million people, and we did ethnic cleansing, and we and we did the war crimes, and, and we dropped uh, bombs onto buildings. We're not, we know Hamas is in the tunnels, and the tunnels are completely unaffected, and we killed 11,000, 12,000 civilians, over 5,000 children. But no, you can't call it a genocide. No, it's like literally the definition of a genocide. Yeah. And same thing that happened with the Ottoman Empire, right? Yeah, mass relocations, massacres, that's a, targeting a specific group. Yeah, people... It's clearly, that is the definition of a yeah, genocide. People think, uh, I think, incorrectly that there's like a number that you have to hit for it to be a genocide. That's not how it works. Yeah. There, there would be no reason to study genocides and to have any kind of designation for what is a genocide if... The only designation is appropriate after the fact. That doesn't mean anything. Then why the fuck are we learning about anything at, at all? Yeah. You know what I mean? Why would you ever learn about how this stuff works if it was only allowed to be spoken on after the fact? Like the top of the hour ad break that I'm going to run right now that I forgot to run. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to go pee. You can talk to the chat while I do that. All right. Sounds good. Okay. This yeah. Is- it's not It's not the destination. It's the, <laughs> it's the journey that makes it a genocide. Okay. Okay, uh, so when he, whenever he does this, I plug my stuff. So, uh, jankforamerica.com, uh, <laughs> running for president. By the way, I bought uh, bidenisgoingtolose.com. I bought selfishjoebiden.com because my name's hard to spell, right? You know, although you guys all know it. But uh, So I bought all those other things so that you could uh, be clear. And Biden is going to lose. Hopefully, we'll talk about that next. And, uh, look, I appreciate all you guys out there. You know, speaking of Thanksgiving, I've got over 6,600 donors, man. That the, the faith they've shown in me is unbelievable. If you guys want to, uh, at a minimum, as a protest against Biden being foisted upon us when he's 81 years old, obviously going to lose, massively down on the polls, total egomaniac, doesn't even want to run, can't finish the sentence. Uh, even if it's like a dollar in a protest, uh, go to jankforamerica.com or bidensgonnalose.com. Uh, and 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 chip in, man. By the way, for and for the fight against um, this discrimination against naturalized citizens. It's absurd. What, is the Habsburg dynasty going to take us over? No. It's The 14th Amendment already said naturalized citizens uh, are have equal protection. They didn't say, oh, but you should read our mind. We didn't really mean equal. So we're going to test that in the courts. And for 25 million naturalized citizens, we're sick of it. We're sick of, ah, you're not really one of us. You're not really a 100% citizen. You're a second-class citizen. And look, when right wing does it, when the trolls do it, I, I have no problem, man. That shit just slides right off my back. I've been through it 2,000 times, right? But it does, but left-wingers should never do that. They shouldn't be like, oh, yeah, uh, oh, I like the original discriminatory constitution, man. Don't, can't you read? It says three uh, blacks are three-fifths of a person. Yeah, that got amended out too, brother, okay? And so equal protection and due process means we protect every American as they are 100% Americans. So if you're in favor of that, jankforamerica.com, help out on that too. God damn, dude. Yes. You haven't stopped. You have not stopped promoting. Holy shit. That's that's how I do. You I was I was mic, sneaking I was sneaking in a little bit of macaroni and cheese. I don't blame you. Mule here. Tell Jank he's got my 500 votes. Dude, I've activated my mules. Awesome. Excellent. Hell yeah. Watch out. Watch out. Watch out your phone. Uh, don't show it on screen. Yeah. Um... So uh, I need all the Krakens and all the mules out there, okay? No, mules like I- illegal. Uh, yeah, like I know. We're, we're, the, we're the 5,000. Okay, I just I, I hope you know that. <laughs> yeah. All right. The most important election of our lifetimes. We need a new candidate. Yeah, yeah. That's so funny. Damn, right. man. We put that website together in a minute. We're going to get a new website. That's obviously super cheesy. Okay. Um, <laughs> policy, policy, policy. Time off for parents. Paid, Ameri- paid family leave. Higher wages, $15 minimum wage, 65% of America's support. 
affordable health insurance, public options, 68% of Americans support, fight corruption and gerrymandering, 90% of Americans support, allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices, 83% of Americans support. Where's Joe Biden? Too busy trying to stay alive uh, so he can cross the fucking finish line. Yeah. Fucked up. So, look, the reason I put the percentages in there is because it's so obvious that all of our policies are super popular, and yet they never get done. And because of the bullshit of the politicians. You know what's ironic about what you just wrote here? Uh, pretty sure Biden ran on all of these. Yeah. So, and by, by the way, that's another reason why I put it. He did nothing to end gerrymandering. He didn't even in, introduce the public option. He purposely threw the $15 minimum wage under the bus himself. Paid family leaves at 84%, never proposed it after it got taken out of uh, the Build Back Better. Why didn't you just do it as a standalone bill? And he, to be fair to him, though, he did negotiate drug price. He did it on one drug, left like 10,000 other drugs, totally uh, unregulated. Uh, so my point is, Joe Biden's a liar. He never intended to do any of these things. They're incredibly popular. He could do them at any time that he wants to. Propose paid family leave in the Senate. Embarrass the Republicans in, into, go ahead, vote against them. Vote against American moms. I dare you. I dare you. Why don't you do it? And then we'll pick up some more Senate seats. Why doesn't Joe Biden do the goddamn bare minimum? Because he's a liar. He doesn't want to do any of these things. These are all things that the donors are blocking. Not Republicans, not the filibuster, why not the Why public option and not Medicare for all? Medicare for all also is super popular, but I put public option in because it's one indisputably popular, including with Republicans. And number two, uh, Joe Biden promised it and didn't even propose it. It's like the bare minimum, and he didn't even propose it. Bullshit. Like if that wasn't a lie, what was it? Get like, his ass. Like the mainstream media catches feelings when you call politicians liars when they're obvious liars, right? I'm the labor secretary when he wins. So. Uh, so I, I'm just telling you what's reality, what Americans know. He didn't try. He is Joe Manchin. He, he, he calls him Joe Joe. He gave him the pen for the Inflation Reduction Act. And Joe Manchin comes along every once in a while and pulls a Wyatt Earp on him. And, he, and Joe Biden plays the role of Billy Bob Thornton in Tombstone. And Manchin looks at him and goes, what, are you going to sit there and bleed all day after bitch slapping him three times? And what does Biden do? Oh, okay, yes, sir. Why? Because he is Joe Manchin. He never wanted to pass any of those things. It, wouldn't it be amazing, guys, if there was actually someone who ran who wanted to pass the goddamn bills? I, can I just say something? I can't believe I'm going to defend Joe Biden here a little bit, but like, if Joe Biden was a more telegenic or more kinetic leader that wasn't 857 years old, I think right now in this time and age, and he didn't do the Israel stuff, obviously, and maybe uh, found more uh, like a like a better work around. And use the bully pulpit more effectively for student loans and other in other things words, that he's he a different person. But go ahead. Well, my point is, <laughs> no, you know what? Fuck it. Actually, even if he didn't do the other stuff, but he was just like younger and more energetic. Like if this was Joe Biden from like 2012, right? I think he would be unimaginably popular. Because here's what I think: I think that uh, the economy was awful, and uh, obviously there was negative real wage growth for a very long time that people are not going to forget about, right? But it's not simply just uh, inflation. Uh, it, there is, there is, uh, there's a lot that happened under the Biden administration that I would factor as decent uh, to, to good even. The NLRB decisions, like allowing the agencies to operate. Then there was a lot of bad uh, immigration policies were not great. Uh, really bad, actually. Uh, the way he's dealt with immigration is uh, not great at all. Uh, but ultimately, what I'll say is I do believe that the economy will uh, will will look at the economy in a very different way unless something horrifying happens or unless something like, you know, there's more like foreign uh, interference from OPEC plus or whatever. Uh, and then Biden uh, demonstrates his inability to rein in like the American uh, oil and gas industry. But uh, but outside of that, I think that uh, controlling inflation and like real wage growth, uh, the experiencing real, uh, wage growth uh, paired up with a lot of like decent momentum from the NLRB. Uh, if he was a younger person, would could have been sold with a much better message. Like he does, in a weird way, try to present himself as like the guy who's like ending neoliberalism. Yeah, which is so weird. It's like. And in, in, it's going to have a negative polarizing effect against that sort of thing, which is what I'm frustrated by, because it's like he's the worst guy to try to champion this fucking message. So, look, did he do things, some things that were right? Yeah. For example, he's not getting nearly enough credit for creating 
for over 14 million jobs. So he more than doubled Trump. And But that's the problem with Joe Biden. In polling, he's polling 19 points lower than Trump on jobs when he more than doubled him on jobs. So, well, look, if you can't make the case for yourself, you shouldn't run. Like, he's like, hey, I want to prevent everybody else from running, but I'm not going to make my own case. And I'm not going to make it against, against Trump. I, every time he does a speech, you know this, he's like, oh, I want the Republican Party to be stronger. Uh, my Republican friends, I love doing deals yeah, with I them. Yeah, I hate that shit. I hate that shit so yeah. much. And, yeah. Well, okay, then go be a Republican. Okay, just, you're not, like, you're supposed to be the leader of the Democratic Party. So, look, he withdrew from Afghanistan. That's good. Yeah, people overhype how messy it was. It was always going to be messy to withdraw from any country. So it's not like Joe Biden hasn't done anything good. Some of the parts about climate change in, in those bills, some of the infrastructure in those bills were yeah, good. Renewable right? energy initiatives, like um, obviously like subsidies, tax breaks for uh, for battery plants. Like you're you're bringing back a lot of jobs in the country, right? In a, in a sector that has like so much growth potential. Um, on that front, like he has done decent things, except right. So, and and you're right that it's much more than a normal Democrat does. Like, yeah, right. A normal Democrat gives you five percent and pats you on the head, right? Uh, and these days, Joe Biden, uh, because of pressure from younger voters and how important younger voters are to the Democratic Party and to Joe Biden, and let alone the Bernie Sanders wing, et cetera, et cetera, he gave us fifteen percent. And so that that's why we're like, oh my God, he's like so much more progressive than Obama. And then, but in reality, it's still eighty five percent bullshit. Yeah. Like, I mean, look, negotiating drug prices is the perfect example. They negotiate one drug, one drug, and they cover up the uh, the fact that we're not negotiating drug prices for every other drug. And then they get the, their mainstream media to go historic reform. He cut drug prices. Total propaganda. Purposeful propaganda, not just to help Joe Biden, but for Joe Biden to help the drug companies cover up their crimes. So they have a monopoly. It's corruption defined. They pay off the Republicans and the Democrats. And Joe Biden is not the guy who's holding them in check. He's the guy who's doing the cover story. He's the dri getaway driver for that. So it's not enough. No, you should have policy. Your leaders should represent you. I know we've lost that like idea completely in America. In the well, last that's why I'm years. so frustrated about like this I iteration of like Joe Biden, once again, refusing to reckon with uh, popular support for ideas like the ceasefire. Right. And uh, just in the most comical way uh, uh, saying, no, like Israel has a right to kill more children. Like, I don't give a fuck. And I get very frustrated with that because like, of course there's going to be uh, Arab voters in places like Michigan uh, a reality that Gretchen Whitmer certainly understands, and that's why she's uh, triangulated her messaging very differently than Joe Biden has so far. But um, uh, there's going to be people that will not ever forget Joe Biden's actions and, and his statements, right? Muslim voters. Um, and, and beyond that, I, I get very frustrated at liberals who yell at uh, the likes of myself who say, I think that it's perfectly valid and perfectly reasonable to say you're not going to vote for a, a president to extract concessions like one year out from an election. That's ridiculous. What the fuck are we doing here? Like, why are we always voting from a defensive posture forever as the the country and the world as a consequence of this country uh, ratchets towards further and further right wing policies yeah. that Republicans push uh, the needle on and then the Democrats solidify and make permanent. Great example I will give you is this. Under the Bush administration, tax cuts for the highest to uh, top tax bracket were, were pushed. However, this was an initiative that was slated to sunset, right? If you recall, the, the, top, marginal, uh, the top marginal tax rate was slated to sunset, so the taxes were about to go back up. Under the uh, Obama administration, Joe Biden personally sidestepped Harry Reid when Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell were negotiating on this, and it was not a, it was supposed to be a non-starter. Like, yeah, these taxes are going to go up. What the fuck are you talking about? Joe Biden sidestepped Harry Reid to make those top tax cuts permanent. Republicans push the needle. Democrats solidify it. They calcify it. They make it permanent. Always. Very so, frustrating. So that deal was so bad that Evan Bayh, a conservative Democrat, wrote a whole book shitting on that deal, saying, I can't believe how much Joe Biden sold us out. 
Joe Biden made those tax cuts permanent in a way that Dick Cheney and George Bush couldn't have dreamt about. This is exactly Joe Biden's job. His entire career is to give the Republicans everything they want and then say, no, it's okay, it's bipartisan. And then the media comes in and cheers, bipartisan, bipartisan. And he's 200 years old. So on marijuana... Brother, just make it legal. Yeah. I mean, come on. Over it's 70- a gimme. It's a gimme. It's, it's a so gimme easy. To lay up. It's so easy. It's not the 1970s. It's not the 1990s. It's not the 1870s, brother. Over 70% of Americans want it legal. Every red state votes to legalize it. Yeah. You dumbass. It's so popular. No, I just, and easy. I, I hate, I hate how fucking stupid the Democrats are. Like, they're bad on policy and they're bad on politics. They're like, at least have one. You know what I mean? At least Republicans do good politics. Yes, They're bad on right. policy, but they do good politics. That's they know right. how to fucking win. Usually, lately, this time around, they're they're suffering from their success like DJ Khaled, but uh, you know, they, they, they like got a little man. too they yeah, they got a little too far ahead with their yeah. with their horrifyingly bad policies. So that, but I, I want to go back to Michigan for a second. Because he's lo- now Biden's lost Michigan. It's gone. His support among Arab Americans was over seventy percent. It's now down to fifteen percent. And so Michigan is the most critical swing state. Trump won it in 2016, lost it in 2020. Makes all the difference. And right now, the polling in Michigan is a disaster for Joe Biden. It is gone. Okay. And a lot of Arab Americans are saying, even if I don't vote for Trump, I'm not voting for Biden. So they're going to sit it out. We've lost Michigan for good if Joe Biden's a candidate. 17% of black voters are also moving in the direction of the Republican Party, which is an unimaginable number that has never happened in American history before. 8% last time around, up to 17% for Donald Trump. Uh, The Hispanic voting bloc, 39% looking to vote for the Republican Party this time around. These are incredibly high numbers. In the past, I've talked about this before. In the past... The number of black people that voted for the Democratic Party could swing in either direction. However, the percentages did not change. It was always like 80%, I mean, not 80, sorry, 90% uh, of the black vote was for the Democratic Party. And then uh, other black voters who didn't vote for the Democratic Party just simply wouldn't vote. I've never experienced a genuine change from the, uh, uh, and this is mostly led by black men in general, but... Uh, a, a voter shift from uh, the Democratic Party to the Republican Party like this. Yeah, so two more devastating stats. Um, uh, so on Latino voters, it, back in 2012, uh, Democrats had a 42-point lead. Now it's down to a four-point lead for Joe Biden. They've lost Latinos almost entirely. It's nearly even now. That is unconscionable, and there is no way any Democratic candidate can win when they are only winning 4% uh with Latino voters. And they're fucking over the youth vote. Like the Israel okay, Palestine that's the stuff. Thing I was gonna get the to. Israel Palestine so, stuff is like not just there's such a gigantic generational divide here uh between people who have only fucking known about Israel from television and like pro Israel coverage versus people who get their information from independent media and also social media. And you see that generational divide. Jonathan Greenblatt is very well aware of it. In a leaked audio, he straight up was saying, like, we have a generational problem. Fifty one percent of American Jews that are under the age of 35 are pro-Palestine. 51%. That, I love it. It's, it that's it's, America. That's, no, but I that's what I'm that. saying. But, like, it's, it's ridiculous. Like, you cannot, if you're under the age of 44, and especially if you're under the age of 35, you have a, I, ex, the exact opposite perspective on Israel-Palestine as every other demographic. Yeah, 100%. Now, to, to the point about young voters, young voters carried Biden in 2020. Remember, he barely won the Electoral College by 44,000 votes, right? And young voters came out 11% higher than they did in previous elections, including against Trump last time in 2016. So, And young voters also carried the Democrats in these last elections in Ohio, Kentucky, uh, et cetera. So now Biden in the last poll is down to Trump with young voters, down by four. Down by four to Donald Trump among young voters? Good night, Irene. Zero percent chance of winning. Biden is going to lose.com. Biden is going to lose.com. There's no, like, guys, the reason I entered the race, why? I think, it, oh, I got this. I'm about to win. Like, uh, like. Dude, hey, don't say that. Right. No. Hey, listen, I'm proud. I, I'm beating three governors right now. So uh, it's a tiny number, but. Trump started at 1%, et cetera. But that's not my point. My point is we've got to knock Biden out 
That's why I'm in the race. My hair is on fire. He meant like like not physically. He no, meant yeah, like yeah, in, yeah, rhetorically, politically, obviously, right? We're not. I just want to specify. I don't yes. want fucking. I don't want the secret service breaking down yeah. our door on our beautiful Thanksgiving so, dinner. But what? Look at what an egomaniac Joe Biden is. Do you see the when he the turkey pardon where he, when he couldn't finish the sentence? Oh, I did not. Oh, you got to pull that up. Look, nobody can watch that clip and then tell me that Joe Biden should be the Democratic candidate. These guys in Washington, they're all egomaniacs. Wait, it says video misrepresents Biden's departure from White House turkey pardon. What? Yeah, b- bullshit. That's just mainstream media covering up for him. Just watch the video. A claim. A video clip shows Joe Biden abruptly leaving this year's Thanksgiving turkey pardoning ceremony. False. In a full video of Monday ceremony, Biden spent several minutes speaking and talking with photos with guests no, after no, pardoning. No, that's not the point. The point is what he said when he was talking. I don't care when he left. I didn't even see when he left. So he, he's, Democracy. he's talking about how uh, he's making a joke about Taylor Swift. Oh, the, that's where the turkey part is. Oh, dude, I saw this. He's talking about like Britney Spears. Like, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, Britney yeah. is really yeah. hot out there, Jack. And he gets Britney Spears and Taylor Swift confused. Okay, older politician. Who the cares? chairman that's of the National point. Turkey Federation, Steve Lykin, Steve and your entire family. I met the guy to meet the entire family. And by the way, I, I, it's my birthday today, and they can actually sing birthday music. I, mean, I just want you to know it's difficult here, turning 60. It's so <laughs> difficult. <laughs> His entire family raised these birds on their family farm in Minnesota. And, and uh, Steve, you can, but no chicken that big, man, I tell you. Just a few weeks ago, I visited another family farm in Minnesota where we talked about the pride of small Find towns and communities, Swift. rural does anyone have the Taylor Swift uh, quote? So, like the clip? Yeah. So, this guy, you know why he's running, right? Come I mean, on, man. Why am I running? I don't know. Where am I? I'm going crazy, Jack. <laughs> so, he's proposed zero policy so far. None. Zero. Because he's not trying to get anything done. He already got whatever he was going to get done done. He, he wants to be a two term president because he thinks one term presidents are considered lame. So he's like, oh, for my legacy and for my ego, we need to be a two-term president, I mean, not a one-term president. Surely, surely egomaniacal uh, geriatric fucks haven't destroyed uh, American democracy in the past four or five years or so before, right? Yeah. I mean, that's never happened. No one's ever died when they're in a profoundly important position of power, for example. Yeah, and what are, gonna, what are they going to do with him? They're going to pull a Feinstein if he if he gets that kind of shape, and Kamala Harris is going to wheel him around and say, "Oh, he says he's for Israel, or he says he's for this." I mean, this is absurd, man. Seventy seven percent of Americans don't think that he's going to be healthy enough to well, finish a, a second term. Morning, is not one, not two, but three pop stars: Taylor Swift, Britney Spears, as well as Beyonce. <laughs> Sky News Australia. Keep As he discussed him. how far the turkeys Bad have traveled income. to be pardoned. Had to work hard to show patience and be willing to travel over a thousand miles. You could say even this harder than getting a, a ticket to the Renaissance tour or, 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 or Britney's tour. She's down in, it's kind of warm in Brazil right now. <laughs> Yo, that's my president. Never mind, I'm back on. He's so sick. Jesus Christ! No, man. no one, no, no demented presidents have ever been awful for America in the past. You know, in the nineties. Look, the guy's the Mad King. Uh, he or won't. In the 80s. He won't let go of power. I mean, look at if he thinks democracy's on the line, he's gonna go run, going, eh, kinda, Brazil's kind of hot, or the so is Britney Spears. <laughs> I'm a little malarkey. Come on, come on, dude. You can't finish a sentence. You egomaniac. You, you know what's really funny? He says, Get it's out of the of, race. He says, it's kind of warm in Brazil right now. And what he's actually making a reference to is the Taylor Swift concert where someone died. Yeah, exactly. Of a fucking heat stroke. And you're not so, supposed to make fun of that. That's not a joke. But he doesn't know. He doesn't know. Like, if it's Britney Spears or Taylor Swift, he doesn't know if it's Brazil or Argentina. He doesn't know if it's Tuesday or Wednesday, man. This guy's going to say no one else should run. I'm the only one who should run. That's why I'm in the race. Jankforamerica.com. Biden's going to lose.com. It's so obvious. So look, Haas, my job is to shake people out of their trance, right? So you think like it, like Dean Phillips is going to like shake people out of this, right? Oh, don't come for Dean, dude. You, okay. if, you come for the, if you come for the Dean, you best not miss. And, and by the way, and, and Dean got in after I did. 
And so, great, I'm glad that Dean's in. My point is all the governors should be in. Governor Whitmer should be in. Governor Pritzker should be in. Governor Shapiro would kick Donald Trump's ass and would start with 10 points higher than Joe Biden. And, Huss, one last thing that's absolutely devastating. If When you have an incumbent president, what happens if gas prices go up in October? Guaranteed Trump win. Guaranteed Trump. Yeah. And who controls gas prices the most? The Saudis. And who do the Saudis love? Oh, the Saudis make no... It's the so Saudis over. are very open about... Uh, their love for Donald Trump. They just very openly are like, yeah, we want Trump back. They're going to jack up the gas prices in September and October, and Biden is going to get landslided. Landslided. He's going to be like Walter frickin' Mondale. He's going to lose the country on his watch because this egomaniac wouldn't put down the gavel. And it's, I don't know why I said gavel. <laughs> it's kind of fun. but um, So he's out there, and he's like, no, I don't think any governor should get so, in. So what I, you, what's your suggestion? And by the though? way, these guys are going around saying that I should be kept off the ballots. They're using the DNC to try to keep me off the ballots. So Joe Biden's for discrimination, okay? Joe Biden get is a loser ass. who can't fight out in the public, get but does ass. those these things in the dark at night. Like, oh, yeah, we'll use the state parties to keep our competitors off the ballots because our guy can't finish a sentence. You can't finish a sentence. Retire. Retire. You're going to lose to Donald Trump. You're going to lose democracy, you narcissist. So who do you think uh, should run uh, outside of yourself, of course? Because you've talked about this. Like, There's uh, people cynically being like, so you're just a spoiler candidate then? And No, I don't know why it's so hard for people to understand the difference between running in a Democratic primary and running as an independent. In an independent uh, race, you could be the spoiler. That's obvious, right? But in a primary, if you say anyone in a primary is a spoiler, you're saying you shouldn't have primaries. You're saying whichever the powerful anoint should be the leader. Hillary Clinton has been anointed by the powerful. You're being a spoiler by running against her. We should all accept corporate rule. Then you're not a progressive. Go be an establishment you know, suck off, you know, and go kiss Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden's feet. But I got no interest in you. We run primaries. By the way, primaries, strong primaries produce strong candidates. 2016, most vicious primary we've ever seen in our lives for the Republicans, and they win. Oh, I thought you were going to say no. Strong no, primary no, for Hillary Clinton, strongest no. candidate, not, not so no. much. Dude, in 2016, the Republicans are talking about dick size on the national stage, and they won, and they won. In 2020, there's 27 candidates on the Democratic side, and they won. So when the mainstream media tells you, oh, primarying uh, powerful people who are incumbents and uh, and uh, and suck off corporate donors, who do you, is, for, for, is spoiler candidate, who do you, terrible, don't ever run against them. Who do you Bow think is, your head. Who do you think is being cowardly right now by not running against Joe Brandon when you know they could be popular? Obviously, I, a lot of people say, Gavin Newsom, but I don't think Gavin Newsom would uh, uh, poll well nationally. Um, so look, there's that's two different things. Who would be more popular? I think uh, Whitmer and Shapiro uh, would be more popular than Newsom, right? Yes. Well, here's the other thing, though. Wait, hold on. Generic Democrat that is lifeless, faceless, polls 18 points better than Joe Biden. 18 so what you're saying? Better. So what you're saying is backed up by the data. Like you're you're not coming at this for people who are shitting on you and saying like, oh, yikes. Uh, Seems like you want the Democratic Party to fail, sweaty, because so many of you are stupid ass DNC fucking mouthpieces and you don't even get paid for it, you absolute fucking dinguses. Assume the position that, like, you just have to sit there and take it. The DNC tells me who to vote for and I vote for it because that's the defensive posturing, that's the defensive voting that we must engage in every time, okay? Something that you need to remember is that, no, this is supposed to be a democratic process, which is why extracting concessions from your leaders is perfectly valid, perfectly just. Pressuring them is perfectly valid, perfectly just. And demanding a better candidate that is actually going to not lose the election to Donald Trump is also perfectly valid and perfectly just. So just remember that when uh, when Jenk is doing this and you're like, oh man, I can't believe he's done this. Like, I don't necessarily, like, I've, I've joked around about his chances, of course, but ultimately, I think he's right when when he says that uh, Joe Biden has to be swapped out with someone else. And I know that, like, uh, I mean, even David Axelrod has basically fucking mentioned this. And I feel like part of the reason why they're not doing it is because they're trying to run the clock so they can say, oh, but we, we can't do anything. The primaries are now here and there's no one on the ballots. And, you know, Joe Biden is the guy. The, we got to so, cross him over the finish line. So the original idea was get more governors into the race. But to your point, you asked about courage. And it turns out they don't have it. So 
Look, they have other things. They'd be 18 points higher than Joe Biden, but they don't have courage. Because if, if any of them had courage, you know how easily they could have knocked this guy out in the primary? If J.B. Pritzker came in with his billion dollars, oh, yeah. he would have annihilated Biden. And also his he would physique. be the president of the United States, but he was too scared. And also his physique, because he is rotund, and Americans want to vote for rotund men. Okay, well, then I'm in good shape. Uh, yeah. Okay, so... No, you are nowhere near as big of a boy as J.B. is, though. Come on. You know, yeah, I, I, I hear you. So, look, John Shapiro beat uh, a Trump acolyte by 15 points in Pennsylvania. He's uh, popular He in Pennsylvania. He'd carry Pennsylvania easily. So Shapiro would be 10,000 times better than Joe Biden. I want everybody in the race. But since they were not profiles in courage, new plan is make Biden retire. Okay, enough with, uh, like, being gentle and polite. The brother's not understanding polite. We need to all get in his face. And we need to go, hey, cut the malarkey, okay? You're 81 <laughs> years old. You got to retire, Jack. Okay, and no, this isn't political. Let me whisper it for you, Joe. You're being a narcissist, and you're going to ruin democracy because you want a second term, you selfish. All right, even I have limits. But uh, but we all got to push him out. No, Joe way. No way, Joe. No way. No way. Push him out. Look, I even bought woundedantelope.com. This guy's <laughs> a wounded antelope. He's, he's not... Everybody knows this, but nobody will say it. So my job is to scream it from the rooftops until people go, oh, yeah, he's 18 points lower than a generic Democrat. We're mental for running this guy. We're purposely trying to lose to Donald Trump. It's yeah. political malpractice of the highest It's going to be order. really funny when they run. It's going to be funny when they run these clips against you and myself to be like, Joe Biden lost because of you and not because he was 800 years old and every poll said that 75% of the Democratic Party don't want him to run again. I don't care. They, they, look, the DNC does propaganda 24-7. They'll do propaganda about that. But even if you said Joe Biden's great, they do propaganda pretending you said he was bad. It doesn't matter. I'm not interested in their stupid propaganda. And and now voters under the age of 50, they're on your bullshit. Woundedantelope.com? They're not interested in it. Yeah, woundedantelope.com. It's not... Oh, my God. It is real. Oh, fucking Christ. <laughs> Woundedantelope.com goes to jankforamerica.com. That's so funny. All right. Well, our family's here, and I think we're going to go sit down for dinner soon. So, you know, on a powerful note, thank you so much for coming on, Uncle Jank. The Jank Off, this time around, we didn't really duke it out at all in the marketplace of ideas, you know? Next, next Thanksgiving. Next Thanksgiving, <laughs> we'll talk about crime again. Okay. All right. Much love, guys. Next Thanksgiving you. in the White House. Next Thanksgiving in the White hey, House. Trump started at 1%. I started at 2%. I'm, I'm doubling Trump. Yeah, this but anything's possible. Okay. Anything's possible, brother. Okay. <laughs> okay. But mainly, let's go make sure we knock Joe Biden out politically. And put a different, Standing better Democratic candidate in his place. Yes. Much a more Democratic popular Democratic put candidate. Put Shapiro, Pritzker, Whitmer, any of those folks. Easy. I'm the only candidate voter, like rooting for other candidates. Let's go. Knock him out. Biden's Dean Phillips. Dean Scott. Phillips, 2024. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. See you, See you tomorrow. Peace. Sunny Los Angeles, California says her song. The starlight to the starlight to the top. It just begun. There he is. Again, her son is streaming, her son is streaming. There he is again, her son is streaming, her son is streaming. Review in the P.O. box, Uncle Uger's face. Sad in this good hatchet prop. Great names take on break Tiny Bernie Sanders LGBTQR force Hold left at your fingertips Anne at your door H3 crowded up Faith the Young Turks online show Three full fucking years of this Plenty more to go 90 day fiance taught some champagne bourgeoisie a trump rally live reaction on mass riot at dc there he is again a
sun and stream.